We have water for you. Good morning and welcome back. Uh, it's nice to have you back in my house. This Freedom of Information Act Advisory Committee meeting marks the halfway point of the committee's two-year term. And I understand the three subcommittees, time, volume, vision for a future FOIA, and records management have been busy holding conference calls on a regular basis, asking questions, delving into data, and discussing ideas for improving the administration of FOIA. And I'm pleased to welcome back Margaret Quoka, an assistant professor at the University of Denver Sturm College of Law, who will present her research on how requests from individuals seeking <laughs> records about themselves dominate some FOIA programs. Professor Quoka is no stranger to this committee. In 2016, I appointed her to the second term of the committee. And thanks to her hard work, along with her 19 fellow committee members, I received seven, seven recommendations and 43 best practices in a detailed final report in April 2018. I recommend improvements. The, the recommended improvements focused on search technology, accessibility, and performance standards. I look forward to an ongoing thoughtful discussion and vigorous consideration of several recommendations from this term of the committee, which ends in June 2020. Before, before turning the meeting over to Aline Simo, a side note, earlier this month in celebration of the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, the National Archives opened an exhibit rightfully hers, American Women in the Vote, which tells the story of the relentless struggles of diverse activists to secure voting rights for all American women. While not directly related to one another, it's worth noting that the women's suffrage and FOIA in their own ways play in ro important roles in our democracy. Thank you to the committee for your work toward improving FOIA. I hope you'll take a few moments after today's meeting to visit rightfully hers upstairs. And if not, you can't make it today, it's open through January 3rd, 2021. So thank you, and I turn it over to Alina. Thank you, David. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for our fourth meeting of the 2018-2020 term of the FOIA Advisory Committee. Whether you're here in person, thank you for coming in person uh, via telephone or via live stream. Um, I do know we have five members on the phone, and hopefully um, I'll check in with them very shortly, and hopefully they're all there. Um, but I am excited to kick off our fourth meeting. It is hard to believe that we're already halfway at the halfway mark. Um, and I know there's been a lot of work going on in between the meetings, and I am so very pleased with all the great work that's going on in the subcommittee. So thank you, everyone, for your really hard work. Um, so Emily Creighton could not be here with us today. Bradley, hopefully, will speak for her. And uh, on the phone, we have uh, James Jacobs. Yes? Hello. Hello, uh, Joan Kaminer. Hi. Hi, Joan. Uh, Ginger McCall. Hello. Hi, Ginger. Uh, Michael Morrissey. Hello. And Suzanne Piotrowski. Hello, everybody. Okay. Thank you for checking in. Um, I will do my best to remember to keep checking in with you, and I have to remind myself there's a delay between the mics going off and the phones coming on, so I constantly have to do that to myself, too. Um, so we have a robust agenda today, and I will do my best to keep it moving. Um, Are we going to have everyone introduce themselves again? 
I guess we could do that. We can, why don't we have everyone introduce themselves? We haven't done that in a little while. So Chris, can we start with you? Sure. Chris Knox from Deloitte. Thanks. Lizette Catillas from Securities and Exchange Commission. Kevin Goldberg, uh, Legal Counsel to the American Society of News Editors. Ryan Law, Department of Treasury. Abby Mosheim, Consumer Product Safety Commission. Bradley White, Department of Homeland Security. Kirsten Mitchell, National Archives, not a member of the committee, the designated federal official. Melanie Paste, Department of Justice. Tom Sussman, American Bar Association. Elise Steven, Cause of Action Institute. Patricia Weff, National Labor Relations Board. James Stoker, Trinity Washington University. Sarah Kotler, United States Food and Drug Administration. Uh, Jason Barron at Drinker, Biddle and Wreath and formerly at the National Archives. <laughs> okay, well, thanks everyone. Um, I have a few housekeeping notes I just wanted to go over. Um, my usual um, spiel, as most of you know, uh, the FOIA Advisory Committee, which reports to the Archivist of the United States, provides a forum for public discussion of FOIA issues and offers members of the public an opportunity to provide their feedback and ideas for improving the FOIA process. We encourage public comments, suggestions, and feedback that you may submit at any time by emailing FOIA-advisory-committee at nara.gov. At the end of today's meeting, as we always do, we will have time for public comments. An OGIS staff member, Sheila Portanovo, our attorney advisor, is monitoring live stream throughout the meeting. So if you have any comments or questions, please feel free to submit them in writing, and we will read them out loud during the public comment period. We are live streaming this meeting, and we'll also make the video, transcript, and meeting materials available on the committee's webpage as soon as possible. Just bear with us, it takes a little while. To promote openness, transparency, and public engagement, we post committee updates and information to our website, blog, and on Twitter, at FOIA underscore ombuds. Stay up to date on the latest OGIS and FOIA Advisory Committee news, activities, and events by following us on social media. Information about the committee, including members' biographies and committee documents, are available on the FOIA Advisory Committee webpage and on the OGIS website. Uh, we have discussed this in past meetings. I just thought it would be important to reinforce um, a few important reminders from our sponsors, the AV folks. Um, they help us run everything smoothly. Um, and there are some uh, cheat sheets by the microphones to remind everyone what to do and what not to do. Uh, the do's are please say your name before speaking every single time. That helps our person who's keeping track of minutes. Uh, please bring the microphone in front of you and hold eight to 10 inches from your mouth before you speak. Please move the microphone back when you're finished speaking. Uh, keep wireless devices to a minimum and away from the microphones. And for those committee members, as I mentioned, the tip sheets are around the table. Um, this meeting is being closed captioned. Um, by following in these instructions, we're going to help make the public meeting more accessible to all. Um, and thank you for following those rules. Uh, we have a couple more housekeeping items before I introduce our guest speaker today. First, we need to approve the minutes from the March 20th meeting, uh, which Kirsten sent around by email. I don't believe we had any comments that we received or any edits. Uh, she and I have either certified or will certify shortly uh, the minutes to be accurate and complete. We're required to do that under the Federal Advisory Committee Act within 90 days of our last meeting. Um, do I have a motion to approve the minutes? Okay, no second required. I'm always happy to take one. Thank you, Ryan. Um, those on the telephone, any objections? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, and those on the phone again, anyone opposed? All right, so by popular demand, we have now passed our minutes. Um, so we also got a request to send around a tentative schedule for uh, the final report and recommendations of this committee. And we, we did it in such a way that we worked our way backwards from the final meeting, uh, which is going to be in June of 2020. And Kirsten circulated to everyone. We're very open to comments and, and um, thoughts about whether it needs to be adjusted in any way. And uh, we haven't heard from anyone yet, but that doesn't mean that the floor is still not open for committee members to comment and and give us suggestions and, and feedback on it. But 
Um, it's a pretty ambitious schedule. I think everyone has had a chance to look at it, but of course the idea is that by our final meeting, which is June 4th, 2020, which seems a long way away, but it'll be here before you know it, uh, we will have our final meeting where we will uh, finalize and vote on the final report and recommendations. Um, I'm always looking for volunteers to be on a small working group uh, to put the report together. That seemed to work very well last term as well. So if you're at all interested in that, please uh, see me uh, during the break or um, after the meeting and let me know if you're interested. Um, there is nothing in the committee's charter or its bylaws that prevents a subcommittee from making a recommendation to the committee on a rolling basis. We like rolling releases, so we like rolling recommendations. Um, so as chairperson, I wanna allow uh, for ample opportunities for the committee to hear ideas from the subcommittees, consider them and have time to deliberate. So. Um, feel free to, to do that at any time. Um, and as I said, we walked backwards from June 2020 and um, with an eye towards finally presenting the subcommittee recommendations by March 5th, 2020 meeting. Uh, so I think that's all I have in terms of housekeeping. Um, and I am now ready to, if any questions before I go on? Questions, questions on the phone? Okay. Uh, so we're ready to uh, introduce our speaker for today, Professor Margaret Quoka. I am very pleased to welcome her back. As David said earlier, she is back because she is no stranger to the FOIA Advisory Committee. She was on the second term of the FOIA Advisory Committee, the 2016-2018 term, and she actually co-chaired with Sarah Kotler, not to call you out, uh, the Proactive Disclosure Subcommittee. And um, while she's here, I urge you to pick her brain about ideas, approaches, She's lived through one full term of the committee. She survived, so chat with her if you want to get her feedback. Um, her PowerPoint presentation is included in your packets, and we will also be posting it on the FOIA Advisory Committee website. Uh, Margaret is currently an associate professor at the University of Denver Sturm College of Law, where she teaches administrative law, civil procedure, federal courts, and national security law. Her research interests center on government secrecy, FOIA, procedural justice, and judicial review of agency actions. She has written numerous articles examining the current state of FOIA and possible reforms, which have appeared in the Yale, Duke, Boston University, and UC Davis Law Reviews, as well as the New York Times. She has testified in Congress on government transparency. Uh, various federal court decisions have cited her academic work, and she's regularly quoted in the national media concerning FOIA. Before joining the University of Denver, Margaret taught at the John Marshall Law School in Chicago and at George Washington University School of Law. Prior to joining academia, Margaret was an attorney at Public Citizen Litigation Group where she focused on FOIA litigation. She clerked for Judge Michael Murphy on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit and Chief Justice Philip Raposa, Massachusetts Appeals Court. Uh, Margaret earned her law degree from Northeastern University School of Law and her bachelor's degree in biology, I noted, mm -hmm. uh, from Brown University. Uh, and just so you don't think that Margaret's focus is only on FOIA, I wanted to mention I, I happened to Google and noticed that last fall she received the Pro Bono Achievement Award from the Animal Legal Defense Fund, recognizing her exemplary efforts on behalf of animals. Yay, Margaret. Today, Margaret presents on her latest research, First Person FOIA, which documents how individuals seeking records about themselves dominate the FOIA landscape at, and at some agencies. Uh, her research is published in the Yale Law Journal article in June 2018 and is posted on the FOIA Advisory Committee website. Um, I also want to quickly add that Margaret is working on a book, uh, which is to be published sometime this year, I think, question mark. She hopefully can address that maybe, uh, entitled Saving the Freedom of Information Act, which I thought is what we're all trying to do. <laughs> so if there are any pearls of wisdom, Margaret, you want to share with the committee, we're, we're all yours. So with all of that, please join me in welcoming back to the FOIA Advisory Committee, uh, Professor Margaret Quoka. Thanks so much for that lovely introduction, Alina. Sure. And I, although I appreciate your efforts to make me seem more well-rounded, the work for ALDF was also <laughs> FOIA-related. Oh, um, <laughs> say that on the website. Um, it's really nice to be back. I appreciate the invitation. Um, and I just wanted to say that although I have about 20 minutes of comments uh, prepared, uh, you should feel free to interrupt me at any time. Uh, there's no problem at all if you have questions or comments that you want to make as I go along, though I'm looking forward to our discussion afterwards as well. 
So um, for those of you that uh, know me, uh, you know that I've uh, spent the past several years uh, working on a series of research projects that was prompted by uh, kind of a combination of three uh, basic observations, um, all of which will not surprise you. One is that journalists um, constantly complain that FOIA simply isn't as useful as they want it to be in reporting the news, even though they were thought to be the prime intended users of the law. Um, the second is, despite the loud complaints we get about FOIA's failings, uh, the federal government's now receiving over 800,000 requests a year, so there must be someone whose interest it is serving well enough to keep them coming back for more. Um, and then finally, my third observation is that um, the costs associated with FOIA and the relative paucity of news media requesters have caused significant criticisms of the law as not adequately fulfilling its basic goals. Um, and so I have delved into this by um, trying to uncover detailed data uh, from agencies across the federal government examining who is using FOIA and what are they trying to get. So to preview um, a little bit of the findings of my research that I'll detail today, the typical re requester now is not the New York Times. Um, it's someone like JP, an individual that the government is trying to deport. JP is a lawful permanent resident, colloquially known as a green card holder. He had a brief run-in with the law, um, the criminal justice system, nearly a decade ago. In that incident, a public dispute broke out between him and a friend. He was 20 years old and for the first time in his life found, found himself in jail for the night. Um, and he remembers going to court, talking to some lawyers, signing some papers. He spent the weekend there and no more. He's got no records from the incident. Since then, he stayed out of trouble, finished college, started a family, and now he's received a notice to appear, which is the charging document in immigration court. And it claims that he's removable because he was convicted of assault. He hires an attorney to defend him against deportation. His attorney uh, says that he has to find out whether the conviction really was for assault, and if so, if that's the only conviction on his record. Sometimes the federal government, interpreting 50 different states' uh, criminal penal codes and criminal justice records, gets conviction information wrong. Um, sometimes, uh, if it's just a simple assault and that's all that's on his record, he may be eligible for relief from removal. Um, and so it's imperative that his attorney see the records that the government is relying on to defend the case. So the attorney will immediately file a FOIA request. It's natural to wonder, why would JP need to use FOIA? After all, the records that JP needs are literally sitting on counsel's table across from him in immigration court, um, in that very courtroom in which he will appear to defend his case. But in immigration proceedings, like in many other agency proceedings, they don't have any mechanism for obtaining discovery. And so FOIA is the only option for people like JP. And of course, JP is not the person that Congress had in mind when they designed FOIA. Right? Rather, it really was journalists. This is a law designed for their needs, not for individuals trying to get their own records. Um, and when I say that the news media was the kind of intended beneficiary of FOIA, it's probably more accurate to say that the news media essentially drafted the law. Um, in 1953, there we go. In 1953, Harold Cross wrote a book called The People's Right to Know um, in his capacity as the advisor to the American Society of Newspaper Editors, which was the most prominent journalism organization at the time. And in the book, Cross called on Congress to legislate a right to access public records at the federal level. Um, he himself subsequently became the legal advisor to the special subcommittee in the House of Representatives that was tasked with drafting the law, and journalists mostly staffed the committee. So journalists were crafting the very contours of the law, not just its vision. But that vision was equally important to Congress, and it's one that this body, of course, is very familiar with. The whole idea of a public uh, a records access law designed for journalists is that the news media would use the law to inform the public about government activities, thereby enhancing the public's ability to participate in democratic governance and hold elected officials accountable. And the legislative history with FOIA is repeat, replete with references for the need to have an informed electorate as vital to a democratic society. So in contrast to that vision, um, if 
this is others' studies, not mine, though my data is very consistent with these findings. Um, this is a sample of studies that have attempted to quantify news media requesters. There's a striking consistency in recent studies that news media are only making a tiny fraction of requests. My findings are uh, similarly uh, situated with these results. And so if it's not news media and watchdog groups, who is it? Um, and even superficial investigations of the data reveal an obvious truth. FOIA is largely used for purposes other than promoting democratic accountability. So my research reveals two prominent groups of uh, requesters that dominate the landscape. First are commercial requesters whose use of FOIA as part of their profit-making enterprises is a topic that I've previously uh, presented onto this body and, and have, have written about before. Today I'm going to focus on the second group of requesters. These are requesters like JP, um, who are turning to FOIA by the hundreds of thousands. They're using FOIA, as the title of my article suggests, in a first-person manner, um, that is, seeking records about themselves, be it their own law enforcement records, their own medical files, their own immigration files, their own family histories, and so on. And to understand um, the dynamics of first-person FOIA requesting, I conducted case studies at a number of agencies um, whose data on FOIA usage I mostly obtained by myself filing FOIA requests. Um, and this is the principal list of agencies I ended up studying and where I only studied certain components, I've listed them, though those components do make up the vast majority of requests at their parent departments. Um, at each of these agencies, first-person requesting dominates the landscape. You can see the percentage of first-person requests represented in green. All others are represented in blue on this chart. At this point, you may be thinking to yourself, oh, the labels somehow disappeared on the slide, and I apologize for that. Um, let me uh, detail that those three on the left um, are all components of DHS, so if you... Um, these are actually in the order. So there are Citizenship and Immigration Services, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, Customs and Border Protection, um, and then uh, Veterans Health Administration, Social Security, and the EEOC follow. Um, you may be thinking to yourself, oh, well, those three other agencies are really small FOIA operations, but that's actually just not the case. Um, at this point, uh, the Department of Homeland Security is receiving over 45% of the federal government's total requests. And so those three components of DHS, which are on the left, columns one, two, and three, um, are, are outsized for that reason. The other agencies listed there are still within about the top 12 agencies by volume. Um, they just look small in comparison because DHS dwarfs everyone else at this point. Um, but more than just the numbers, uh, my study, uh, I coupled these, the, the data gathering with interviews of um, mostly attorneys who make first-person requests on behalf of their clients to find out what role FOIA is playing at each of these agencies. Um, so all of these labels somehow disappeared, which is really unfortunate. Um, but I will say, so um, here I've got um, uh, these... Um, this is a DHS request. These are by component. So you'll see that's Citizenship and Immigration Services on the right. Um, that's ICE is in blue. And that's uh, CBP is in uh, orange there. And so you can see that those three components make up the vast bulk of, um, of the requests that DHS receives. And um, almost all of them are by non-citizens requesting their immigration records, though the reasons are varied. So JP's story um, explains one of the reasons. Individuals request their records because they're in removal proceedings um, and they have no other um, access to discovery. Not only are the records sought under FOIA in these circumstances critical for information about past convictions, as with JP, but also allow a lawyer to obtain uh, prior statements the client may have made to immigration uh, officials, uh, to reconcile any inconsistencies, or to prepare for cross-examination on the stand. And without FOIA, immigration attorneys explain to me they're essentially litigating in the dark. Probably much more often, though, than in remo removal proceedings is a, a relatively smaller percentage of these requests, 
probably much more often than that. Um, individuals are seeking their uh, immigration records as part of their bid for an affirmative immigration benefit, such as an application for a new or different kind of visa or an application for naturalization. So these requests serve two primary purposes. One is to provide details about the applicant's immigration history to ensure that there's nothing that would prevent the person from obtaining the benefit that they seek uh, before filing the application. Um, and the other is to ensure consistency in that application with the past records if it is filed. And the second purpose, uh, separate purpose of making a FOIA request in this context is to obtain a document that the government holds but which the applicant needs to submit with their application. So for example, someone who's applying for a green card from within the U.S. has to prove um, that they lawfully entered the country. They may no longer have that documentation. Or someone may need to file um, a previously submitted uh, family-based petition or with their application to adjust their status. Um, and so they'll use FOIA to get these documents from the government um, that they need to submit with their application. So despite the kind of outsized presence uh, uh, or volume of requests related to immigration, first-person FOIA requests are hardly constrained to that context. Let me talk briefly about the other agencies included in my study, although I'm afraid, that I'm afraid to hit the button and see the missing labels again, and there they are. Um, but at the department, I will try to describe this. At the Department of Veteran Affairs, I studied the Veterans Health Administration, which um, accounts for 86% of all VA requests, so this is the largest component by far. Of the 26,000 and change um, the year I studied, at the very least, 77% of the requests are first person in nature because they were filed both under FOIA and the Privacy Act, um, the latter of which provides a right of access only to your own records. The reasons for first person FOIA requests um, at the VA are more varied than DHS, but similarly demonstrate the private nature of the interests served. So um, if you could see the labels, this would break down uh, the subject matter of requests at the VHA. Um, medical records are the green category dominating. This is 67% of all requests at the Veterans Health Administration. Um, Frequent requesters looking for medical records include individuals for sure, but also insurance underwriting firms, which are essentially making first person requests as the representative of the individual seeking a policy. Um, one frequent requester is also a law firm that specializes in social security disability law, which would be most often requesting their own client's medical files in support for a claim for benefits. Um, another group of individuals um, more than 500 in the fiscal year that I studied in 2015 are families of deceased veterans who are seeking a type of military separation document that's required for accessing a military funeral benefit. Um, beyond medical records, the next largest group of requesters in this category are for uniform offense reports, which is um, a, uh, a type of police report essentially for incidents that occur on VA property. And the logs reveal that, that folks basically want copies of um, the statements that they made to VA police uh, or reports of incidents that the requester was involved in. Um, I'll mention that by way of reference, the VHA uh, in this entire year received only 352 news media requests, amounting to 1.3% of the total requests that year. Um, I will uh, also briefly talk about the Social Security Administration, um, which appears to have a particularly unique FOIA practice as uh, you would have been able to see from this chart. Um, the two largest categories are for um, SS5 forms or numidant records. That's the SS5 is green, numidant is blue. Um, those are both records about original applications for a social security number. Uh, as best I can tell from the evidence I've been able to, to piece together, it appears that individuals are primarily making these requests who are doing genealogy research about their own family histories. Um, so in the strictest sense of the term, this might not be a first person request because they're asking about some other individual, but if we think about this a bit more broadly, it's clearly information about the requester they're seeking, it's their own family history. Um, in addition, I think we can, you know, this category also falls within first person requests in the sense that the interests served are largely not about um, government oversight or accountability. And then finally, um, at the EEOC, um, there's another prime example of first person requesting. Um, the EEOC that year received over 17,000 requests. 
And a full 95% of those requests uh, were for what is uh, designated as a charge file. Um, that's an investigative file that is created when someone files a charge of discrimination under one of the various statutes that the EEOC administers, like Title VII and the ADA. By statute, the only person who can seek a charge file under FOIA is the person who filed it and in some limited circumstances, um, the responding party. And it can only be filed during the 90 days after the EEOC has completed its investigation and the charging party has been given um, its notice that has the right to sue. The employer or respondent can only request that file if they actually do sue, so that's the, a very small subset of those requests would be from them. And so by definition, nearly all of these requests are first-person requests. When a person files a charge of discrimination, um, the employer or respondent must file its position statement, which is basically like a brief arguing its version of, um, of, what, of, of the events that are, are complained of. And the position statement will often also include um, various exhibits, like the employer's EEO policies or the employee's um, personnel file concerning uh, their performance or behavior. And like with immigration proceedings, the charging party has no right of access to those documents through any sort of administrative discovery during the investigative process at the agency. So as a result, employment attorneys that I spoke with confirmed that they file a FOIA request immediately upon having a new client walk in the door or as soon as they obtain a notice of a right to sue from the agency. So um, from this primary research about um, the various first-person uses of FOIA at federal agencies, um, I believe that there's a significant mismatch between first-person FOIA requesters' needs for their own records, which are very real and in many cases extremely important, um, but, but there's a mismatch between that need and the way that FOIA is able to meet that need, and certainly a mismatch between that need and what FOIA was intended to do. Um, so there's three basic problems, I think, with, uh, w with using FOIA for en masse first-person requesting. The first um, is that it undermines, actually, the due process interests of the requesters in many cases. Uh, I'll talk about each of these a, a bit, um, the, but I'll preview. The second is that I actually think in many cases these are inefficient ways of information delivery for the agencies. And the third is that um, it oftentimes, I think, is undermining FOIA as an effective transparency tool. So let me talk about each of those a, a little bit. Um, the first is, uh, as I described, a significant amount of first-person FOIA requesting serves as a mean for, means for private individuals to arm themselves when they're subject to some sort of government enforcement action or seeking to mess, make their best case for a government benefit. So they're in some sort of agency process or proceeding. Gaining access to information in these instances can promote fairness in the proceedings, accuracy in the outcomes of government decision making, um, and what others uh, in this field, other scholars, have labeled a sort of due process-like benefit, even if it's not technically a due process right, as, as courts would define it. And so FOIA may be serving extremely important interests in these regards, um, but I think my research shows that it's serving these interests poorly. Uh, one big problem is timeliness. So both immigration attorneys and employment attorneys explain the problems of having to go through FOIA to obtain documents. In essence, sometimes the information simply doesn't come in time to be useful to the client's case. So these quotes are representative. There's been times, this first attorney says, uh, where guys have been removed and then a FOIA result comes back and my strategy would have been different. It's troubling thought. Um, or this from an employment lawyer, um, they got a notice of a right to sue and they want to file a lawsuit and then basically I won't consider it unless I can review the EEOC's file. And this attorney said that he simply sometimes won't take a client or a case um, because there isn't enough time by the time he's consulted to get the results of the FOIA request uh, before the deadline to file a lawsuit. Another problem in this context um, is that uh, when information is withheld or redacted, Few clients or their attorneys have the resources to fight a collateral battle over records. So this attorney said, lawyers can't afford to take time and energy to litigate FOIA issues on the side of the case that they're already litigating for their client. And so relevant information may never reach the individual. Whether those withholdings are right or wrong can't be tested. Um, and then finally, as uh, this, 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 
lawyer's frustrated statement says, um, sometimes attorneys um, or pro se litigants end up having to move forward without the information that they, um, that they need. Um, and so uh, this, of course, increases the likelihood that an individual is unable to access benefits to which they're entitled or is unable to defend against enforcement proceedings where significant interests are at stake. So apart, I'm going back to my three-part uh, mismatch, um, apart from due process failures, which are on the individual side, um, FOIA also, I think, is oftentimes in these circumstances an inefficient mechanism for the agency if we look at it, uh, their their um, processes overall. Um, so, for example, at immigration agencies, um, the person who is in um, removal proceedings has to file a FOIA request with the main FOIA office, which then has to assign um, that request to a FOIA uh, officer uh, for processing. And that person will inevitably come back around and look to and find the same sets of records that the trial attorney has on their desk um, in immigration court. So this not only duplicates work in some sense, but also means that the judge in immigration proceedings in immigration court can't resolve any disputes that arise over the records. Um, and um, uh, many attorneys noted that when they haven't received um, a response to their FOIA request, they will use that as a basis for continuance in immigration court. Um, and so thereby potentially holding up the underlying proceedings and using greater agency resources in that regard as well. Um, and I, I can certainly, um, I, I think there are some reasons why the agency hasn't moved in that direction. I'm happy to answer questions about that, but, um, and there are various other examples like that that you can find going through these agencies. Um, and then finally, um, I, oh, whoops, sorry. I, I, I think that uh, on this third point, um, first person uses of FOIA, particularly because of their volume, I believe are undermining FOIA to some degree as a transparency tool. So as my research documents, first person requests um, do advance important interests, but they're primarily private interests and not the public interest in government oversight. Um, and so certainly there are public benefits to first person requesting. Let me not, uh, let me not be um, unclear about that. For example, there is a general public interest in fair and accurate determinations by agencies. But these types of interests don't go to the heart of FOIA's imagined purpose about informing the public about government activities. Um, and in fact, the agencies that receive a deluge of requests that serve primarily private interests may be less responsive to those requests that do implicate government accountability. So news media, watchdog groups, private citizens using FOIA for oversight purposes may be essentially crowded out due to resource constraints. Um, and. Um, uh, and because the FOIA offices are so overwhelmed um, with other requesters. And I think the potential for such crowding out is underscored by the perennial concerns about delay as the prime reason why FOIA falls short of serving its intended mission. Um, and so I wanted to end by briefly touching on a, a few solutions that I think we could consider. These are, I will say, there is no one size fits all uh, approach across the federal government. Um, but rather than any effort to limit FOIA rights, which I think would be a serious mistake for various reasons that I'm happy to elaborate on as well, um, I believe much more promising reforms seek to reduce the need to resort to FOIA by requiring or incentivizing agencies to meet other information needs more head on. Um, that is, finding tailored mechanisms outside of FOIA um, that would deliver this to, their, to, to the um, constituent population. So this approach could, I think, reduce maybe even vastly the number of FOIA requests that are made and free up FOIA offices' resources to better serve FOIA's core mission and potentially would serve the private interest better as well um, and, and could lead to some agency efficiencies. So the obvious example that you're already thinking of now that you've been hearing me is discovery in some agency proceedings like removal proceedings, EEO investigations, some benefits applications. Um, could, these could alone eliminate the need for large swaths of FOIA requests. Um, it could also improve the fairness of those proceedings um, and could empower those most familiar with the records to deal directly with any disputes over access. Um, another possibility in some contexts is to eliminate the need for individuals to request records only to then include them in an application they're submitting right back to the same agency. 
So if the agency already holds certain records that the applicant needs and knows they exist, the applicant could, for example, have a process to designate that they're relying on a record the agency already has. This dynamic exists to some, uh, as to some requests at immigration agencies, Social Security, and the Veterans Administration. Um, so this is what I call request and return. Um, and there are individuals who are held up in their bids for, for example, naturalization by a year or more waiting for a document that they, they are just going to return to that same agency. Another promising um, avenue for meeting the needs of first-person requesters head-on um, is actually affirmative disclosure. So um, this might sound uh, kind of uh, non-intuitive because these are personal records that would have private information. But, for example, um, online access to medical records, something that's already very common in uh, the private sector, um, could be an opportunity for eliminating the request for tens of thousands of medical records a year at the VA. Um, the VHA is already revamping its electronic health records system. Um, patient portals common to the industry may alleviate some of that burden. Um, and then finally, there are some agencies that are already creating separate request processes for certain records that are often needed by individuals. So for example, the IRS um, has a completely separate system for requesting uh, your own tax returns. None of those requests go through the FOIA office. They're not processed by a FOIA officer. They're not counted as a FOIA request. Um, more agencies could use this strategy for um, routine documents that really aren't uh, the kinds of requests we're imagining. That is to say, there is no reason you cannot submit a FOIA request for your own tax returns, by the way. You certainly can, and no one at the IRS is saying that you can't do that. Um, but there's a separate process that's much more efficient and straightforward, and so everyone avails themselves of that opportunity. So for example, the Social Security Administration has what appears to be almost a completely separate process for getting SS5 and numidant records, those original applications for Social Security numbers. Um, but nonetheless counts every one of those requests as a FOIA request. Um, I actually think that it would be meaningful to separate out what is and isn't FOIA um, for our conversations about resources, our conversations about volume, our conversations about FOIA policy. And I think it muddies the waters over any debate about whether FOIA resources are being well spent when we're including those sorts of separate processes um, within the FOIA ambit and counting every one of them as a FOIA request. Um, so with that, I'm going to stop, and I will look forward to your questions and comments. Tom. Tom Sussman. Uh, great research, very helpful. A few comments. First is, uh, you talked about uh, in treating these as FOIA requests, it muddies the water. And my recollection is, is that was the intent because, about, from the agency perspective. Because going back, these have to be joint FOIA Privacy Act requests because unless they join the Privacy Act, then there's a fee, there's uh, exemptions, it's things that don't apply in a Privacy Act request. But you join it with FOIA because of the time limitation and the enforcement mechanism. But at some point, my recollection going back is that the agency said, aha, we can undermine the transparency purposes of FOIA by having all of these tremendous numbers of requests that we have to do, get more resources, show that we're complying more because we do routinely give this information out. So I think going back to anything that anything that invokes privacy shouldn't be FOIA, just as a simple, I mean, Justice Department could give this as a reporting guideline, would then allow you to do more accurate research and allow us to figure things out. That's, that's one point. The second is there's a, the criminal justice analogy of the Brady Act, you know, when, uh, a decision. So, if you're facing a criminal prosecution and the prosecutors don't turn over the file, you win. Uh, that would be a pretty easy uh, way to deal with things like immigration, uh, that where you have to wait for a year before getting any result or get deported while you're waiting for your file. Uh, uh, and it could, you know, it, it, this is what you would call due process reinforcing. Uh, and then the final uh, question. We've known about these issues for a long time. Uh, we have VA representatives and immigration representatives on this committee. Why have agencies and the executive generally been so resistant to these special cues, special processes, uh, proactive uh, measures to be able to do a more efficient job? It seems so 
intuitive to those of us hearing your analysis that you sort of wonder, uh, why are we doing things the old way? Thanks so much for those comments, Tom. Um, let me say something briefly about each of them. Um, in, in terms of the first one, kind of the intentional muddying of the waters, um, I can't speak to intent the way you can, I think, probably, um, uh, from where I'm standing. But I can say that, um, you know, for example, Europe, which just uh, adopted, adopted GDPR, um, has a completely separate process for requesting your own uh, records. Um, your own, so, that, so almost all European countries have a different law about um, kind of FOIA, right, and uh, the Privacy Act, but they're actually different, right? So um, it means that when you're having a conversation about um, open records requests, freedom of information, um, nobody's talking about these kinds of requests. And when I have done some presentations about this work in Europe, they all just look completely confused, right? Um, and I think it really speaks to the fact that there is a way to separate these things out, and I think um, I think it would be useful for us to start to, to, to work on that project. Um, some of the examples that I'm using are even easier, though, than, this, than what you're suggesting. So, for, for example, at the Social Security Administration, when you're asking for your SS, SS5 uh, records, there's a standard fee, there's a separate website request process, right? There's separate information you submit. It just doesn't look like a FOIA request, right? Um, it's not billed as a FOIA request. They're not counting hours. It's just every one that you get is X number of dollars. It's not very much. It's like 20 bucks or something, right? And so they have a routinized way of dealing with it. They just are counting it all, right? So I think some of these are really easy to separate. We could start with the lowest hanging fruit. Some of them are more complicated. Um, I'm not saying this is administratively simple at this point of where we are, uh, but I do think it is a worthwhile project, and it's something that we're seeing as the trend across the world. Um, on the Brady question, of course, the, the um, Supreme Court has never held that in civil proceedings there is a d due process right to discovery, um, much less in agency proceedings. And so as a formal matter, um, a Brady-like rule simply doesn't exist right now. Um, that is not to say that we haven't had strong recommendations for administrative discovery coming out of ACUS and other bodies. Um, and many agencies that have successfully adopted administrative discovery proceedings knowing that it, it is in fact possible. Why agencies aren't moving in this direction? Um, again, I, I hesitate to speak on behalf of others who would know these answers better. I think that um, these are, from my understanding, uh, these are types of strategies that agencies are thinking about. I think there are some very, especially in FOIA offices. I think oftentimes part of the problem is there's a, a budgetary problem, right? You take money that used to be FOIA money and now we need like more money for trial attorney time and more money for immigration courts. Um, I know at DHS in particular, uh, the concern over overburdened immigration courts is so strong because we're having years backlogs for people with asylum claims um, to get a hearing at all that putting more work on the trial attorneys and the immigration judges is something that would truly need a resource investment. Now, if we look at the budget overall, would that resource investment maybe be smaller than what we're doing now? I think there's an argument that it could be, but I think there are, there are from what I'm told, there are administrative hurdles to getting to that sort of solution. That is not to say that I don't think that they're not worth pursuing. And certainly, I think this is an area where, um, where, where you know, even Congress uh, could have a role to play um, in some of these solutions because those mandates um, or even budgetary allocations can make a huge difference. Uh, this is Melanie Paste from Justice. I just wanted to address the, the first point about the tracking of uh, first party requests separately from FOIA requests. Um, in, if we have had since 2007 a really clear delineation, if, uh, specifically along the lines that only when the Freedom of Information Act is utilized in any way in the processing of a request is it counted for purposes of the annual FOIA report. Before that, the exact opposite had occurred in agencies like VA, for example, used to report that they had millions of requests because they were counting all the requests that they got from veterans for their medical files where they were purely being processed under the Privacy Act. So I had the same concern uh, that we're talking about here, that that's skewing the FOIA statistics. And so we drew a line between 
uh, requests that are processed entirely under the Privacy Act. Mm -hmm. If FOIA is not touched at all in the processing of the request, it does not get included in the annual FOIA report. I think what's, what is trickier here in the U.S. versus European countries is that, of course, our Privacy Act is so narrow and has big exceptions. So even though you're a first party request, if it's a law enforcement file, for example, it, it could be totally exempt from access. So those requests become FOIA requests. Uh, and then the search limitations are quite different under the Privacy Act versus FOIA. So a lot of requests end up being processed under both Privacy Act and FOIA. Uh, so that's why it's, it's, a, it's trickier for us. Yeah, and I think Melanie's comments really highlight the need um, for some of these areas may really require a uh, congressional yeah. intervention. Yeah. Right? I mean, I think some of these things, yeah. to be clear, agencies can be doing on their own. Um, but I think there are other areas where there really might be a need for um, additional legislation. Bradley White, and uh, I want to make clear before I go any further, I'm speaking for myself and definitely not the Department of Homeland Security here. <clears throat> that said, uh, I did seven years at ICE, so I'm incredibly familiar with these immigration records that you've talked about, and we most definitely apply both the FOIA and the Privacy Act to these records. And while I know that the process at ICE and USCIS would love to see that constantly increasing workload go down, there's still the issue of the information that is exempt. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, forgive me for my ignorance here, I haven't done discovery in ever. Uh, <laughs> but would there be a mechanism <clears throat> in some kind of discovery process in an immigration proceeding to exclude information that is exempt from the FOIA? Because within those immigration records, there is a ton of information that people just can't get. You can have a regular immigration file that may have your uh, application for benefits or it may have something else, but it could also have um, the report created for the immigration enforcement operation that caught a person. There's tons of other information included in that file beyond just your individual records. But because a person was caught up in a particular operation, all that other information winds up in the file. Uh, I can tell you, we've seen immigration files that <clears throat> take up three or four red wells that go this high. And whenever you see that, you know there's a ton of sensitive stuff in there that definitely cannot go out. So while reducing the workload would be great, there still needs to be a mechanism to protect this information. And there is a place for FOIA there. Absolutely. So, um, you know, in regular civil discovery in, um, in federal court or in state courts across the country, um, privileges are applied um, routinely to certain privileged information. Now, those privileges in civil discovery are mostly developed by, by common law, right? So we have kind of attorney-client privilege or work product privilege or, you know, um, patient-doctor privilege, those sorts of things. Um, those are litigated routinely in um, discovery processes, and I don't think there's any reason that um, rules could not be crafted to have privileges that apply particularly in these contexts. So, for so, example, well, I'm not, a, but I'm not speaking about privileges. That's mm -hmm. exemption five. I'm speaking specifically about law enforcement sensitive information. So, the, uh, you know, the way the agents uh, approach a situation, the way they take someone down, the use of informants, all of those things wind up in an A file. And so that wouldn't be covered by a traditional privilege. C correct. So I think um, in this particular context, and let me not wade too far into waters that are um, maybe out of, out of my depth, but um, I will say in this particular context, I think uh, what, uh, there's various ways you could uh, imagine a discovery right. So for example, um, DHS could promulgate <coughs> its own rules Right, right now, there's nothing stopping them from um, creating its own rules about uh, discovery in immigration court, which could delineate each category that would be exempt or could simply wholesale incorporate the FOIA exemptions into their discovery rules. All I meant to do by way of analogy was to say that we already have some information that's exempt from discovery in civil proceedings and other contexts. Those things are litigated with the use of a, a privilege log or a log of a, you know, exemption in federal court essentially from discovery. Um, it looks not very different from, say, a Vaughn index. And, um, and so you could use the same mechanisms to have the producing party, the trial attorney in immigration court, redact those things that they think are withheld explain them if there's a context, contest, and then have the immigration judge make a decision just as a civil judge would, right? a, a judge in a civil case would. Um, so I think there's, <coughs> and you could have an appeals process for that just like you do um, also in, uh, in civil discovery. So I think there's no 
logistical reason why the, the, the security exemption concerns that the department, I think, rightfully has um, could not be incorporated into a discovery regime if uh, either wholesale by incorporating the FOIA exemptions or by promulgating their own rules about what information won't be available in civil discovery. Um, to my mind, it would probably be better to just incorporate the FOIA exemptions, um, partly because at that point you won't then end up with people also making a FOIA request because they know they'll get the exact same information under either process. So, um, Kevin Goldberg, a uh, American Society of News Editors, twice removed from Hal Cross, but apparently a long way to go in terms of accomplishment. Um, <laughs> I, I guess my question is, and I, I apologize if I miss this. Um, you cut off at basically three agencies. Why did you choose that cutoff? And were there others that were sort of close, or was it, was it in part because there was a huge gap to the other agencies that had the same first person request percentage? Because I guess the next question is, if we decide this is very important, and I do think it is, I think one of the reasons that I really enjoyed this is it's things we all kind of knew, but it quantified them really well, uh, to which I had never seen before. Where do we go next if this is really something we're going to pursue? Yeah, absolutely, thanks. Um, so um, I started by going through the entire list of agencies and their components separately um, for uh, trying, I, 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 will, I will just be transparent. I was looking to study those agencies where there's lots of first person requesting, right? So I did a separate study where I was looking to study agencies where there were lots of commercial requesting. So my goal was to find those agencies knowing that they were out there. So um, based on the work of the agency, I tried to make intuitive guesses about who would, what agencies would have a lot of first person requesting. And I made requests for data at those agencies. I think in this study, um, and I can go back and look at the exact number, I maybe submitted about 25 requests. The question was about usable data that came back. Um, so I can say since that time I have found other good examples across the federal government because uh, for the book that Alina mentioned that I'm working on which will not be published this year um, uh, but I appreciate the optimism uh, the um, I've been trying to tell a more complete picture about who's requesting across the federal government so for um, that research I've filled in these last couple of projects with another 80 some requests. I'm up to about 50 agencies of data now across the federal government. Um, and um, so I can tell you that there are other good examples. Um, state, for example, has um, it actually, in, in, and you find pockets of immigration everywhere suggesting the need for some serious look at, at immigration procedural reform. Um, but regardless, state, for example, um, you, uh, you see, um, I I'm, this is too preliminary for me to be like maybe cited about it, but because um, I'm still staring at this data, maybe about half of them are first person, and state is huge, um, right? Um, so I've got a couple others that I can't pull off the top of my head, but I will say that this is a project that I'm working on fleshing out the rest of, so in the hopes that uh, in the hopes that I'll be able to tell as complete a picture as I'm able to about who's requesting across the federal government. Um, I will also say that just with DHS alone, I think we can safely say that first person requesting is the biggest single cohesive group of requesters across the federal government and is more than half. Just just looking at these agencies alone. Can I, I'm just going to make a really quick comment that I'm going to let Jason go next. Um, so I just want to point out to everyone, and I'm, we're not tooting our own horn, but we actually um, see a lot of first party requesters come to OGIS for assistance. Mm -hmm. So as a result of that, we actually were in touch with uh, USIS in particular, their FOIA officer, and uh, she suggested that we pull together an immigration forum. And we hosted one right here in McGowan uh, last fall. It's available on YouTube, NARA YouTube, uh, where we actually invited um, several, uh, a variety of, of different agencies who actually get immigration-related requests. So we had um, we had State Department, we had you know, all the usual players, we had USIS, we had ICE, we had CBP, we had State Department, um, we had HHS. HHS um, gets a lot. And, uh, but we were really, our, our purpose was to try to educate requesters, right, who are scrambling, trying to figure out how do I get access to my information mm -hmm. and where do I go? Because it's such a complex web. We also um, published a FOIA Ombuds Observer, 
which is available on our website, which kind of explains to requesters and to everyone in the public, this is where I go if I want this kind of document. Mm -hmm. um, but we definitely see that very, very often in our work in OGIS. Um, the only other comment I was going to make, I wrote a note to Melanie, but I, this is the one experience I can share as a longtime litigator of civil litigation versus FOIA litigation. The big difference in civil litigation is there's a great <coughs> vehicle called the protective order. And we don't have that in FOIA litigation. And we definitely, I think, need to explore that a little more in, in different contexts because mm -hmm. I think it really makes a big difference. I see a lot of heads nodding, so that's good. Yeah. Um, Jason, over to you. Uh, thanks. I, I want to pick up on Kevin's point um, and ask a process question about your own research. Um, in your excellent article, um, I note it was published in the Yale Journal in June 2018. And Footnote 74 I'd like to read um, with okay. my apologies for anyone here, uh, including our DHS representative. Uh, at, at the footnote, you said, I filed FOIA requests with each of these agencies on April 16, 2016. USCIS acknowledged the request but never responded. ICE responded by directing me to the publicly available version of their logs on their website. I, feel, I filed an appeal on June 23, 2016, to which no response was ever received. CBP responded by directing me to the publicly available version of their logs on their website. Um, and then you filed a June 18, 2016 request to which no response was ever received. This, thus, as of this writing, none of the three provided data beyond what is publicly available on the website. And thus, however imperfect and incomplete, I resorted to reliance on public data. This leads me to um, note uh, that we can all appreciate the irony of a FOIA researcher filing FOIA requests and not getting information about FOIA statistics. Um, let me ask three questions. First, did you ever hear from any agency uh, that you filed uh, FOIA requests for? Second, have you used OGIS uh, to uh, facilitate your research? And three, since you are a expert litigator, uh, given your experience, why wouldn't you file a lawsuit against DHS or any other agency that's not responding in a timely fashion? Those are all excellent questions. Um, n no, I never got data from these three. Um, I do have a lot of requests, uh, you know, for logs. The, mostly I'm requesting FOIA logs. Um, so over the years I've now had quite a few of them. So it's difficult. Um, I actually have a research assistant who does nothing but my requesting for me. So she just um, does my, manages my requests and follows up and bugs people and appeals and things like that. Um, so uh, why not fight every one of them at some point? Um, it's just time, you know. So I, I try to give uh, I try to I give myself a year long timeline. So for any new project I'm starting, I give a year before I'm trying to get data to where I start requesting, and I cut it at a year. So at a year, I say I'm giving up now. I've done everything I can do. Um, I did not go to OGIS. I did go to some people inside the agency who I um, know personally and tried and failed. Um, and then um, I, uh, I do a lot of nagging. I do administrative appeals. Lawsuits are just um, time consuming and I have a job um, that uh, <laughs> I did sue the, I got pro bono representation and a uh, public citizen represented me in a lawsuit against the IRS, which I won. Um, I'm still getting data, sort of, um, and it's just, uh, it's difficult. I think, uh, I will say this, I think that overarching this, is that um, agencies do not keep their data in one uh, form or format. They don't all keep the same fields, they don't all keep the same data, they don't use the same formats, they can't produce it in the same ways. Um, I ask for a lot of fields, there's a lot of things I'm interested in about the FOIA logs most of which agencies have to keep in some way or another, but it's not all in one database often, or they can't pull it in one database, or they can't produce it in a way I can read it. So um, I think there's a big technology barrier in some cases. Um, and the other thing that's true is that, um, and I, when I was on this body last term, pushed for a recommendation that was eventually adopted that agencies keep and publish a uniform version of their FOIA logs. I know that this sounds like just my personal pro project, but I actually think that if we all had better data on who is using FOIA and what, and we could aggregate across the federal government and it was being kept in the same way, that would vastly increase our understanding about where we have opportunities for improvement. Um, and so um, that's actually something that 
Congress could legislate, like a requirement that FOIA reports include the actual logs, right, um, and, and to have certain fields that are included within that, um, I think would make a huge difference for all of our understandings about how this process works. So I don't want to kind of blame any particular agency. I really think that right now they keep the data they're required to report very well, and then the rest of the data that they keep is kept for their own internal purposes. And it's sometimes very difficult for them to produce it to the public, or I, I simply don't end up in success. This is, this is Melanie uh, Paste again from DOJ. I just um, want to just, when, in response really to Jason's comment, we, I think it's important to remember DHS, since DHS was the example uh, used that, from the footnote you read, they process hundreds of thousands of FOIA requests every year. So it's not like they're just sitting around not doing anything under FOIA. And it's, they are processing hundreds of thousands of requests. And the basic premise under FOIA is that we do them first in, first out. So anytime somebody says, well, did you, did you do this? Did you do that? Are you, it, it, it sounds like you're implying, well, there should be a way to jump jump the line. If you make, a, make, a, make noise, um, or, and obviously if you file a lawsuit, an unexpected consequence of that, and I think a, a negative consequence is that it can make you go to the front of the line. But of course, that's not fair to all the hundreds of thousands of people at DHS who are waiting for their record. So we have to be careful when we just talk about, well, you had a long delay. It is unfortunate. Obviously, it's the biggest problem in FOIA we all recognize that's why we, why we have this committee. But it, it's not a question of, is there something you can do to somehow jump in front of everyone else? Because that's not right either. Patricia, before I get to you, I just want to give the folks on the phone an opportunity to chime in. I don't want you to think I forgot you. So Ginger, James, Joan, Michael, or Suzanne? Any questions or comments? Yeah, hi, this is Michael Morrissey. Oh, sorry, after you, James. No, go ahead, Michael. Yeah, this was super, super helpful research. And I think, like some other people said, I think was something that kind of echoed a lot of, of what we've seen, but kind of maybe didn't have the numbers to kind of back up. Um, one of the things I've kind of noticed is that there have been a few attempts, I think, like the FDA, I think they just actually had another announcement uh, just within the past few months where they started proactively releasing more material requested by requesters. This was the first party request, but this was, um, you know, sort of uh, frequently commercially requested information that now instead of requesting, people can just go to a, a portal and download proactively. I'm curious if, if some of these sort of alternative resolution mechanisms, do you think that, uh, that it could be a successful path forward, or do you think there would be some challenges if there was some inducement for agencies to set up sort of alternative uh, paths beyond FOIA um, and say, hey, first go through this path and see if it gets you what you want. Maybe it's quicker, maybe it's hopefully automated on the agency side um, while not reducing the uh, sort of requester's right to if they're dissatisfied with that response than to file a FOIA, formal FOIA request for appeal. I mean, I guess instead of sort of saying, okay, this is no longer part of FOIA, this part of an alternative mechanism, um, but you still retain your FOIA rights. Is that something that you, you've thought about in terms of sort of that balance of letting people not give up rights, but then really encouraging people to uh, use an alternative mechanism? And is there any sort of ideas you have to make that successful? Yeah, that's a great, um, a, a great question because I think it goes, goes to the heart of um, certainly an, an anxiety I have <laughs> about um, how we might change things, which is that I, I don't actually think it's the right way to go to um, limit anyone's ability to file a FOIA request if that is the route that they prefer. I do think that we can make routes that are so much better that nobody will prefer it in those particular situations. <laughs> um, and so I don't actually think we should ever be in the situation of recommending that we first have to um, go jump through certain hoops, and then you can file a FOIA request. Um, but when I talk to people who are doing this kind of first-person requesting, so mostly lawyers who um, have you know, volumes of clients, they're requesting their own clients' records, so those are you know, on behalf of their first-person requester, they don't prefer FOIA. They just don't have another option. Um, and so I do think 
that if there was another option, now would there be an adjustment time where everyone's like, do we get the same thing? Do we not get the same thing? Should I try and do both just to be sure? Yes, I do think it will take time, right, for people to trust that an alternative system is giving them the same information that they could get under FOIA, that they're getting everything, that it really is better. But I don't think people want a separate process if they don't need one. I think they want clarity on how to get, you know, I, I'm thinking of Social Security right now where there's just like a separate way to request SS5 documents. It doesn't seem like there's any reason for anyone to like write a letter and send it to like FOIA at SSA.gov, right? Uh, it, nobody wants to do that because there's an easy way of getting the thing that they want with a flat fee that they know what it is and it's very clear. Um, so I think uh, in my mind, your suggestion does raise some anxiety for me about the idea that we might reform in a way that precludes people from filing a FOIA request because there is an alternative process or makes them go through certain hoops first and before they can do it. I just think we can do this in a way that nobody will want to when there's a better alternative. I hope that answered your question. Was there anyone else on the phone who had a question for Margaret? Yeah. No. Okay. Uh, Patricia, did you have a question? Jane, I had a question, but it was similar to Michael's. So. Uh, I'll just say thank you, Margaret, for your research. It was really fascinating. Thanks. Hi, Margaret. Patricia Weth from National Labor Relations Board. It's very nice to meet you in person because your FOIA request came into my agency. And I can now give you a personal apology for how, because it took us a really long time and your name was on my, you know, top 10 oldest. So it, it killed me. It killed me that it took us so long to get to it. But um, it kind of goes along to what Jason was asking. You know, there were just some technology issues and staffing and we did the best that we could. So anyway, it's nice to just <laughs> thank you. Just tell you in person. I do I'm have sorry. Your data now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you I will say, I, I, that's, I, I meant it when I said I think that there are real, there are real barriers because this information is not kept uniformly. Um, and I think that this is an area where I think it was fantastic that this body was able to adopt a recommendation for the uniform production of these types of, um, this type of data. I think it's something where actually this would be a very easy and appropriate way for Congress to also just um, legislate a reporting requirement that would um, that would ensure uniformity. Because right now, there's no way to coordinate across agencies about how we're keeping this information. Right. I will also be happy to provide a, um, an, a set of slides with the labels so that you can distribute it after Alina. I apologize for Sorry the, about the whatever technological labels. glitch caused that. I apologize. Uh, Margaret Ryan from Treasury. So first, thank you for the, the shout out for IRS. Um, <laughs> uh, I have to. IRS instituted a process uh, several years ago to uh, encourage access to um, tax records directly from the IRS outside of the FOIA process. I think it's a, a good, it's been a good, and I, from my observations, been a challenging, challenging to implement. Um, uh, but it has resulted in a decrease in the number of FOIA requests for tax records, okay? Um, one thing I would suggest and encourage you to look at, so you've, you've focused in your research on who's submitting requests. I think it's important also to look at who is processing those requests as well. Um, with IRS, uh, FOIA requests are processed at the field office that the tax records are located by the individuals that have access and have the file in front of them. Um, my experience at DHS, similarly, you know, files are kept in one location. They're processed primarily by FOIA staff at the agencies. Um, and so it would be helpful to understand where an agency's records are being processed and who is doing that work. Um, and then similarly, any change you make to the process for going outside of the FOIA process, you know, we have to ensure that, you know, people have additional reasons. You made the point earlier about uh, immigration attorneys adding to their workload. I think that is a big concern. And then lastly, on a legislative front, I I'm gl was glad to hear you say there, you know, th there's a role for Congress here, and, and the Privacy Act uh, does not afford access rights to non-citizens. And so their only right of access is through the FOIA. And so I think 
I know that uh, DHS, through policy, had extended access rights to non-citizens. Um, I don't believe it's, I'm looking at my colleague at DHS, I don't believe that's the policy currently. Uh, so that is an area, I think, ripe for, um, for Congress to look at. Thanks. Those are all very helpful comments. Thanks. Okay. Anyone else before we let Margaret go? Tom, Tom Sussman again. Uh, just before you go, uh, and you and I have had this exchange a few times, but you, in your introduction, you always talk about the origin of the FOIA and intended for use by media, and you measure present uh, uh, value, productivity by media use. Um, but, uh, and, and your first article, of course, slammed uh, business users. Uh, I think you have a good slammed point. Slammed a little hard. I, I, I think you have a good point in terms of recovery of fees. But my reading of the legislative history uh, is that the issue of secret law and protecting businesses whose information request was, was a large part of the original history. So it was, it was certainly contemplated by Congress that there would be businesses would benefit from yes. and use the Freedom of Information Act. And I, frankly, you missed that completely in your first article. So I think um, we, so first off, I agree that um, the legislative history has references to business use of FOIA to discover um, kind of policy, government actions, government enforcement. Um, I do believe in my first article, I acknowledge that some businesses may be using it in that oversight way, but that my research shows that businesses are largely using it not for oversight purposes, not to discover what government is doing, but to discover what each other are doing. Um, and so I think that absolutely businesses could be using it in its intended way, and once in a while they do, but mostly they're not. Now on the other hand, I think there's lots of good reasons to allow business to, to promote, to have businesses have access to these records. It may improve competition. It may improve the marketplace. Um, it may even, you know, there, there are some government oversight purposes. It may allow them to participate as they should be able to in the democratic process of rulemaking, of commenting, of um, whatever else may be happening at an agency. Um, but largely, those businesses are closely holding that information for their own private benefit and not for a public oversight benefit. Um, and so <laughs> in my first article, what I uh, um, tried to expose, which you and I may still differ on, and I'm okay with that, um, is that I believe, again, this is sort of a mismatch issue. Um, businesses are largely using it for reasons not imagined, um, and, and in fact, largely may not be, this may not be the best way of getting this information to them. And I think that um, affirmative disclosure played an outsized role in that regard because business information doesn't have the kind of uh, personally identifiable information that might invoke privacy concerns. And so there's a lot of opportunities, I think, um, in the commercial arena for, um, for agencies to promote information delivery in other ways. That is not to say that I think that there, so I, I don't um, think that I, uh, I'm certainly not against business use of FOIA in any way. Um, I just think it's not working very well as an information delivery mechanism. One-off requesting was meant to be kind of an idiosyncratic thing, right? You hear about something, there's a story out there, there's a scandal out there, there's something you're curious about, the news is trying to uncover what's going on, what is this agency doing? And so writing a letter saying these are the records I want makes perfect sense in that context. When you're writing a letter every day saying give me another of the same form that I got yesterday but in a different, you know, enforcement incident or whatever it is, isn't, doesn't make sense, right? And so um, I agree absolutely that businesses can be using it in a way that was intended by Congress. Um, and uh, uh, it's just not what we're seeing as, as volume. Once in a while, sure. But the volume of these requests is not driven by that. Yeah. This is Tom Sussman again, not to prolong the discussion, sure. but for the first decade, decade and a half, until agencies lost all these cases relating to enforcement manuals, advisory opinions, uh, guidance documents, mm -hmm. secret law. Mm -hmm. uh, FOIA, that's how businesses mostly use FOIA, and all of that's now proactively disclosed, so it, it, they don't need to use it anymore. And I agree with you entirely on the competitive issues. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to say that I think it served a purpose mm -hmm. in a lot of litigation uh, where the courts had to or order Justice Department, IRS, SEC, FTC, mm -hmm to make its secret law public, and now it's all public. Yeah. And I think that um, 
that's a, a perfect example of a success story in terms of, uh, uh, of being able to preclude the need to rely on FOIA for things that right. the public has a, a strong interest in. Okay, great. Margaret, thank you so much for your presentation. We're really grateful. And if she sticks around during the break, perhaps you can go and ask her some other questions. Um, so we're at our 11.15, um, a little past 11.15. Uh, we're going to take a 15-minute break. I want to remind everyone there are uh, restrooms uh, immediately outside the theater, also downstairs next to the Charters Cafe, where you can also purchase food or drink but you may not bring it back into the McGowan Theater. Um, please come back promptly at uh, 11.35. And we stand adjourned for recess.
All right, I think we're going to get started again. So if I can invite our committee members to return to their seats, that would be great. We're missing Ryan. So I don't know where Ryan went. Oh, he's coming back. Great. <laughs> Okay, so welcome back everyone. Hopefully everyone had a good break. Uh, thank you again to Margaret. She was fantastic. That was a great presentation. Uh, so we went into a lot, a lot more time today than we normally do for subcommittee reports. I know there's been a lot of activity. Folks have been very, very busy. Um, extremely grateful for that. Oh, and Melanie. Where's Melanie? Does anyone see Melanie? She just popped out. Okay. Um, well, I'll just talk very slowly. Uh, so we're going to hear from each of our three subcommittees today. Um, and this is Kirsten's order. It's no particular order. I think we're going to try to shuffle it around. But vision goes first, and then records management, and then uh, time volume. Uh, the subcommittee co-chairs will update us on the work that the subcommittees have done in the interim. Melanie, I'm talking very slowly to give you a chance to come back. Uh, where they are as of today and raise any and all issues they want the committee to discuss and hear about and, uh, and consider. So um, this is a great opportunity for us to do that when we're all together. Uh, by the way, do we have folks back on the phone? Ginger, checking in? Yep, I'm here. Great. James? No James. Going yes, on. I'm here. Oh, good. Thank you. Uh, Joan, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Michael. Michael Morrissey. No, Michael. Okay. Hopefully he'll join us again. Suzanne, are you still there? I sure am. Okay, great. Thanks. All right. Michael, please check in when you come back. Um, so the vision subcommittee report, um, I'm going to turn it over to Chris Knox and Joan. I, you guys will decide who's speaking. Sure. Okay. And, and Thank this you. is Chris Knox for the record. I'm going to kick off and then, and then hand it off to, to Joan. Um, we met shortly after the last full committee meeting and committed to uh, a biweekly cadence for our subcommittee. We made I would say the majority of those, uh, we weren't able to make the, the last one or two of them due to vacation schedules. Uh, we decided the best path forward, after we finalized our mission prior to the last, uh, sub, at the last committee meeting, we decided the, the best path forward was to take that mission and break it into its logical five subcomponents 
and then assign a, an individual leader for each one of those subcomponents. One of them actually got rolled into another one, so we ended up with four subcomponents. I'm going to list them and, and announce the leader and then ask that each one of them give an update on the, on the subsections. So the first one was raising the priority of FOIA within the executive branch that's led by Joan. The second one was reconsidering the model of OGIS within the FOIA community that's led by Patricia. Uh, the third one, which rolled into Jones, is in increasing accountability for FOIA and transparency. That ended up getting combined with raising the priority. Uh, so the, the now third one is managing expectations between agencies and the requester community. That's led by Kevin. And then stressing the need for increased and continued financial support for agency and FOIA programs. That's led by Michael. So I'm going to turn it over to Joan to give an update on the, on the priority sub, subsection. Thanks, Chris. Um, and everybody let me know if you can't hear me. Um, so the first subgroup, they're raising the priority um, and increasing accountability. Um, we've had a, a few meetings and um, we are working to establish a, a set schedule going forward. Um, we had a very successful last meeting in which we um, discussed and set certain levels that we see the priorities falling at, particularly um, in the public level, congressional, executive branch, agency, and staff. Um, at this meeting, we also discussed our information gathering approaches uh, and the decision. In the end, was that we would dovetail with other subcommittees' written surveys as well as potential interviews at uh, the ASAP conference. The um, participants from various subcommittees met with ASAP. Unfortunately, I was unable to participate on that call, so I will let the other subcommittees brief out on um, the results of that conversation. But particularly for our group, we would utilize both the written uh, questionnaires as well as these potential in-person interviews. Um, to target these different um, certain levels that we've established and, uh, you know, collect information, uh, hoping to ensure that we don't have any duplicative question or information gathering by working closely with the other subcommittees. Um, additionally, we uh, develop certain subject areas that we are um, looking for um, when we're gathering this information. Uh, this includes, but it's not limited to, uh, the FOIA report, training and qualifications, requester status, FOIA public liaisons, and records management. Um, and then lastly, we will continue, particularly in our upcoming meetings, to develop specific questions. But with that, as I mentioned before, we're going to take a close look at what has already been set by the other subcommittees and see what we can utilize from uh, what other groups are gathering. And that's, uh, that's it. If there's any questions, I can answer them. Questions from anyone? So we'll move on to reconsidering the model of OGIS. Patricia? Hi, this is Patricia West from the National Labor Relations Board. Uh, so to begin our project, we needed to lay the foundation um, regarding our knowledge of OGIS. So we, we reviewed the OGIS annual report as well as um, the Sunshine Week, the event celebrating OGIS's 10-year uh, anniversary. Uh, we also had a meeting with OGIS. Um, then Tom Sussman was kind enough to uh, link us with Toby Mendel, uh, the executive director of the Law and Democracy Center, um, who was just a font of information, and he um, gave us guidance as to some international models for us to look at. So uh, currently, uh, currently, what we're doing is we're looking at international FOIA ombudsman models. We're looking also at state FOIA ombudsman models as well as federal agency uh, ombudsman models. So we're going to look at all three of those and. Um, you know, compare our research. And so that's where we are on that project. Thank you. Uh, now managing expectations. Thanks. Um, yeah, we, we fell a little bit behind uh, to the point where I feel like I'm going to, after this, have those dreams again where I'm back in school and the exam's coming. <laughs> Only this time, I promise, I'll be wearing clothes. Um, 
<laughs> the good news is my committee is probably tapping into the ASAP process as well because we had talked about, obviously managing expectations requires deter, you know, identifying what some expectations are before you manage them. So we had kind of, especially because I'm part of the time volume subcommittee um, that is, you know, the, the sub-subcommittee of that, that that you'll hear about that is doing some of these surveys, um, realized that we could do uh, utilize the same process. We have not come up with our questions yet, but the good news is um, we absolutely have a deadline to do so. So I will be reconvening my, my group um, within the next week to start writing these questions. Thank you. Uh, was Michael able to join on the phone? Michael? Don't hear him. This is Joan. I can give you an update from the last time we had our, our full group um, since Michael hasn't had a chance to rejoin us. Joan, that would be great. Thank you. Great. <laughs> I don't think he has. Um, so it just apologies. This is the update from the beginning of May. Um, but at that time, uh, this group was working at uh, scheduling their ongoing meetings, and Michael was um, develop pulling together pre-existing information, and he was uh, drafting um, a, a consolidated document that they can use to, to work off of. Um, just to note, this group was also working very closely with the time volume on recommendations for increased resources, uh, so that's another aspect of our subcommittee that's working closely in conjunction with um, the other groups. Uh, so maybe if he comes back on later, um, he might have an additional update, but that was the update from approximately a month ago. So. Uh I'm sorry, Lizette, just give me one second. This is Alina. I just want to ask a quick qu clarification. Maybe we should just brief the rest of the committee on what we mean when we say we're going to go through ASAP, because that sounds like such a shortcut, and I feel like some folks don't know what that means. Should we talk about that? Sure, and I wasn't able to join the last Oh, the OK, last well, Kevin meeting. will talk Kevin, about were you, were you on yeah, that? I, I suppose I can talk about that. Yeah. Um, what we're talking about is the ASAP training conference, which is Kirsten from July, 20, July 22nd through 24th. Right. So there were, as you'll as you'll hear more about in the uh, time volume subcommittee, and maybe I'll just I'll just kind of preview a lot of that now anyway, and just not retread that ground when we get there. Um, you know, we had done in time volume a series of questions, and they were sort of threefold. They two were sort of you know the the scalable question of uh, to both agency officials and separately requesters, which are you know on a scale of very much, not very important, very important, or don't care, you know, or, or you know, extensive problem, whatever, uh, you know, sh kind of pick one answers, and others were more open-ended questions, and we were going to try to figure out a way to work with ASAP, especially on the agency officer side, to, to, you know, use them as a vehicle to reach as many agency officers as possible at one time. And we, we ran into a couple hiccups there after meeting. You've, you've already heard them, that, that a couple of these subcommittees had met with Claire Shanley and others um, from ASAP to discuss this. It, it became apparent that we couldn't just sort of send this out through the FOIA Advisory Committee, I believe, for, for Paperwork Reduction Act purposes, or just through ASAP, because there were some other logistical problems there. So what we decided was we would take this back and make it more of a, an open-ended written type question. We, we would reduce the total number of questions, at least on the time volume subcommittee I'm working on, um, reduce the number of questions and make them more open-ended and kind of just commit to being at, on site at ASAP when it meets here in DC to have access to as many access professionals as we could in one place. Um, it may, it, 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 it may not be a, a, an entirely scientific process, but I think we've realized that we're also moving this from more of a, a scientific quantifiable to more of a you know, quant quantitative uh, questioning to a qualitative <laughs> questioning where we're going to come out with, I, I would hope, some themes that we will then build into recommendations. But, but a, a, it's not the ASAP. I, I definitely want to be clear. It is not the ASAP survey. It is using ASAP as a means of getting access to as many people as possible in one place and one time. And again, the, de the, the timing of it could not be better because it forces us to have a deadline that is soon, will require action, and of course, have us coming out, I think, with a good body of, of research with a lot of time to go forward and move on. 
Great, thank you. Uh, Lizette. This is Lizette Catellius. So I just wanted to um, follow up on what Joan said. Um, Michael Morrissey's committee, we did meet, I'm on that one with Patricia as well. And we started talking about just preliminary issues surrounding the issue of financial, more financial support uh, for FOIA programs. Um, and we're gonna be scheduling the next meeting soon, but we did, we're able to touch base. And um, there is a lot of overlap with the committee that I'm on, the, the vision and subcommittee in terms of looking at, um, you know, managing volume of requests and within the time limits that we have. So um, I, I'll speak about that one more when we get to that. Okay, great. Any other questions from the committee for this subcommittee, Vision? Uh, this is Ginger, I have some questions. Sure, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, first, I apologize for not being more active in things for the last few months. I've had some personal stuff going on that some of you may be aware of. Um, but I am back now, and I had a few thoughts on a couple of things that were just said. Uh, first, on the question of OGIS's role and what other offices are doing, especially around the country, other um, FOIA ombuds offices, I would be happy to connect with people offline about that because in, as part of starting my own office here in Oregon, I have done a fair bit of research on it, and I do have some good contacts with folks who are at other similar ombuds offices around the country. So if that would be helpful, um, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, and second, I had a few questions on the ASAP survey. Um, first, the presence at the ASAP conference, what is that going to look like? Is it, is it going to be like a table at the conference or a panel? What, what were the plans for that? Uh, uh, yeah, Ginger, this is Kevin Goldberg. Um, first of all, thanks for, thanks for offering up that research. I, I was just talking with Patricia about that I'm, I'm on her sub subcommittee and, and uh, as I've been calling them and, and we were just talking about some of that and that sounds like it would be really helpful as to what we're trying to do to cut through to the, the core. Um, yeah, again, uh, with regard to ASAP, it's not a panel. I would say it's probably, again, I, 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 it's, it's an easy shortcut to call it the ASAP survey. I would say it is our survey utilizing ASAP just so we, we are clear about it, which I think means, you know, Mel, I think what, what really talked about is Claire has been gracious enough to offer us, and Kirsten as the president of that organization, has been gracious enough to offer us probably a table at the event where we can just sort of be there and, hey, you know, hey, we really need some help and this could help improve your jobs and stop by and talk to us. I think one thing I'll preview now that we may want to talk about here is we've all done a really good job of, I think, within our, or our individual groups that are trying to do this survey of cutting our questions down to a minimum. I think, you know, I will talk again about time volume or maybe even com completely preempt that to say that Sarah has been writing the requester side, and I've, which I don't know if we're going to be able to run through the ASAP event because there may not be enough requesters there. We, we might be looking to Mike Morris, Michael Morrissey and others about reaching out to the requester community through their sites. But I've been doing the agency questions, and I think we had sort of three sets of almost eight or nine each, you know, and certainly about 25 questions, and we've cut it down to less than 10. But, of course, if we have too many different individual surveys going through subcommittees were right back to an untenable uh, portion. So we, we obviously have to manage that across all of the three subcommittees or any of the subcommittees that are using ASAP as their vehicle. But it's definitely a table. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's really great. Um, if you need someone to sit at that table for some portion of time, I would be happy to because I'm going to be at that conference for the full conference. Um, it may also be useful to connect with the panelists at the conference so they can plug the table and just remind people to go out and, and fill out the survey. I'll make sure I do it on the panels that I'm on, um, but maybe Kirsten could help to coordinate that so others can do it as well to maximize the amount of... Um, That's awesome. Yeah, survey. I'm happy to do that. And I've carved out my schedule, I think, or at least blocked off my calendar to say as, as long as I can be sitting there that those days just plunk myself down as well. Great. Yeah, let me know if you'd like some company, because I'd be happy to do it. I'd love it. All right, Ginger, anything else? Nope, that's it for now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anyone else have any questions for the Vision Subcommittee? Going once, going twice. Tom, do you have any comments? Because you're on the Vision Subcommittee. Okay. Uh, so moving on to records management, we have a robust 
presentation that Ryan is going to kick us off with. I'm going to kick it off here. Okay. So, hi, Ryan from Treasury. So thank you for the opportunity to provide the committee with an update on our work on the records subcommittee. So um, I first wanted to let everyone know that uh, the records subcommittee has met formally twice since our last full committee meeting, uh, and our work continues in this area, and we're scheduled to meet on Thursday of next week. Um, as I mentioned during the last full committee meeting, or I think Jason mentioned during the last fully full committee meeting, uh, we met with the Federal Records Officers Network, which is a group of federal employees that are uh, records officers. Uh, it's a diverse group of folks, different grade levels, different agencies. Um, some at the bureau level or they're like a lower agency <coughs> level and some at headquarters level. Uh, and they meet regularly to discuss records management issues. And so uh, we approached them and met with them on April 9th, and provided them an update on the work of the FOIA Advisory Committee about what our goals were and what we're, we're all working toward. And specifically, we wanted to start a conversation with that group about records management and FOIA and to get their feedback about how records management and FOIA could work better together to improve both the administration of the FOIA and then also um, the public's ability to identify and access records and information. So uh, we asked a number of questions, and quickly ran out of time to collect all of the responses, but the FRON uh, has sent out our questions to their member base, and we hope to get the results of, of those questions soon. And we're actually, uh, Jason and I are returning to the Fraun meeting next Tuesday, or next Tuesday, um, to discuss with them um, those questions again to get their feedback. And uh, we look forward to providing an additional update on kind of what we learned there. And so some of the survey, some of the questions we asked um, kind of expanded on the records management self-assessment that NARA and, and that I believe OGIS participated in and developing this year. Uh, we asked questions like what agencies can do, in what ways can agencies do a better job to make it easier for FOIA requesters to understand where records are located or where they might exist in the agency. We asked questions around, um, we had, we're asking again, we're asking records management folks, do they believe their FOIA officers were aware of how email is preserved at your agency? We asked a question, which uh, we'll talk about in a second, was asked in the Chief FOIA Officer Report, uh, what improvements can or should be made to your agency's search capabilities with regard to records? Uh, also, we asked about whether uh, those records management folks felt that, they, that NARA had a role, um, or do they have a role in educating FOIA professionals about records resources within the agency? So we've asked a number of questions. We're really uh, interested to see the response. I believe we got some feedback from the Fraun leadership that we've gotten a, a few responses. Um, hopefully we'll get some more before the, before their, uh, before the meeting next Tuesday. Um, so we look forward to updating the committee on, on the work there as well. We also, Jason and I wanted to talk uh, third about um, the results of several surveys that we conducted of uh, agency chief FOIA officer reports. Uh, as you may know, the uh, previous FOIA advisory committee made a recommendation that um, OIP add a question to the chief FOIA officer report, and that question was, uh, is your agency leveraging technology to facilitate efficiency in conducting searches, including searches for email? If so, please describe the technology used. If not, please explain why and describe the typical process used instead. And so we have taken a, I believe, non-scientific kind of uh, uh, approach and just grabbed a bunch of answers to uh, the Chief Foyer Officer report to this question. Uh, and Jason was going to talk a little bit about uh, our observations there. Uh, thanks, Ryan. So uh, <clears throat> I think it's excellent, uh, Melanie, that DOJ uh, took up the recommendation of the prior FOIA Advisory Committee and added this question. Um, in section four of the chief FOIA officer report. I spent um, a happy Saturday um, reading all of the reports. Uh, not all of them are in yet of the 2019 reports, but a lot are, and they make for a fascinating reading. Um, 
the uh, I'm so happy. <laughs> the uh, the survey that uh, is one of the handouts that here we got online is simply <clears throat> my attempt to cut and paste the answers to basically every cabinet agency and most, not all, of the, uh, at least uh, uh, of the larger uh, independent agencies and other agencies that are not cabinet departments. Um, so it's not 100 percent, it's just, it is what it is, it's just a cut and paste. Um, I encourage everyone on this committee to take a look at the entries and see what you think. Um, I don't want to prejudice anyone's own evaluation, but let me make <clears throat> the following observation, which is that um, I applaud the efforts of agencies to report that they're using e-discovery software um, to perform searches of electronic records uh, at their agencies. And you can see numerous examples in these reports uh, where agencies have made steps, uh, initial steps towards uh, using software that I believe the committee is, has heard uh, in the past about, and I certainly have been an advocate of. Um, what is um, obvious to me in looking at the reports is that uh, the government has a long way to go uh, with respect to um, what is the coming wave of digital records. Um, we have several hundred agencies or components of the government that have adopted the NARA capstone policy on email. There will be tens if not hundreds of millions of emails across the government that are in capstone repositories. Um, what the e-discovery community that I have been a part of um, uh, for the last decade or so have been advocating is using advanced search technologies that go beyond keyword searching to deal with this enormous volume of electronic records that in the e-discovery world are routinely searched. Um, and so what is missing and what I'm hopeful to have a conversation about is whether this committee could be a forum, whether it's from our records management perch or otherwise, is to have a, a, a dialogue with agencies about how they can uh, go uh, further along the path and be more mature in their use of existing tools and technologies that are in the marketplace. They may not have experienced the need yet for searching across um, millions of emails um, be, for the typical FOIA request. That's not the typical FOIA request that an agency receives. But the future is coming. And because the repositories are growing, I think it's <clears throat> there's a, a, a role for us to play in giving advice and try to foster a dialogue. So I would urge people to take a look at this. Uh, not really a sur survey, it's just a, it's just a summary of what those responses were. And if you have thoughts, let us know. Shall I go on to training or you want to uh, say something, Ryan? Can I just ask one thing, Jason, for everyone who's on the committee, does everyone know what Capstone is? Don't want to put anyone on the spot, but if you don't know what it I, is. I'm happy to say that NARA adopted a, a, a new email policy, which is uh, <clears throat> A voluntary for agencies to adopt, but hundreds of agencies have. And what it accounts for is it's a different way of record retention about email. Its email is singled out where senior agency officials have their emails designated as permanent at a capstone agency. And those capstone accounts are permanent records. Um, and everyone else's uh, email at an agency uh, is governed by a general record schedule 6.1, which uh, accounts for, um, it says seven years as the uh, default for uh, program records. And so um, it is a way of capturing a huge body of government records in the form of email and attachments. And um, I think our committee has uh, uh, several recommendations that relate to the fact that the government is very much still in the email business and needs to um, provide access to what are growing repositories of these records. Are there other questions about uh, our work here in this area? Anyone on the phone have any <clears throat> questions? Okay. Okay, so this is Ryan again. So we'll, uh, uh, fourth, I wanted to, uh, we also conducted a 
survey of agency training resources for records <coughs> management and FOIA staff. And, and um, that's also in your handouts today. Uh, and Jason was going to talk a little bit about uh, our observations there. Well, the, the handout that is here is also from Melody's Chief FOIA Officer report. And what I did is, in this case, uh, on the front page is just the top page. It's just my attempt at um, uh, uh, merging together uh, or just listing uh, a series of the kind of FOIA training that's out there. And um, that a lot of it is conducted by DOJ. Um, and some of it is by other groups that are out there. Um, and um, it is uh, across the board, there seems to be a tremendous amount of training going on across agencies. Um, I particularly wanted to single out two examples, and I put them here uh, because I thought they were interesting. One was labor reporting, the Department of Labor reporting that um, as part of FOIA training, they had an individual, a council, who has a title that includes the Federal Records Act, which um, was something that I was looking for specifically for this records management committee to see whether FOIA and records management were being talked about. Um, and then I also wanted to applaud DHS uh, for what I considered across the board to be the most uh, fulsome, uh, comprehensive set of training courses that uh, are reported anywhere in, across any of the government. And so Bradley, I think uh, you should deserve some credit here for um, the work that DHS <laughs> has done um, in training. Now, having said that, um, those who know me knows that I always save the best for last, which is that I, I, my criticism of the report so that what's, what's, and what is animating a recommendation from the Records Management Committee is that um, there's a tremendous amount of training, but I think that uh, FOIA officers would benefit from uh, a course um, that is created. This is my own view, not the committee's view, but we're going to, it's part of our talking about, uh, talking through recommendations. Um, a course that would be aimed at FOIA professionals throughout the government that DOJ and NARA OGIS can talk about and whoever takes the lead, but um, a, uh, uh, and in that course it would be FOIA professionals learning about records management so that they can do a better job um, of, uh, of search, doing an adequate search across um, agency collections, including digital collections, including capstone. So I think it would be, I mean, particularly a benefit for FOIA officers to understand capstone, but you know, there's a broader realm of issues here. And so um, what was absent from the training was any kind of, well, what I saw was a records management module in FOIA courses. They may actually be there, but I didn't see it uh, listed, and we can have that conversation going forth. So it would be one of our recommendations to do a more robust training uh, in whatever form that DOJ and NARA um, can do. Okay, before we move on to the last point, are there any questions on training? Somebody nodding, nodding their heads. Okay. Uh, lastly, we wanted to... Do I have a quick question? Yes. Sorry. Um, I know it's an outside group training, but did you take a look at the offerings from ASAP at the National Training Conference? I think that they cover some record retention issues. Kirsten would probably be more well-versed in this than I am, though. They are. ASAP is listed here, and, and but I defer to Kristen, uh, Kristen on, on, you know, what that entails. Um, this is Kirsten. There are records management tracks, if you will, and offered every year at the NTC, the National Training Conference. Um, so it does happen. I can't tell you what will be offered this year. Does, this, this is Melanie. Doesn't um, NARA, it's NARA as the Records Management Agency itself offer training? If you guys know, I would imagine. Oh, of course it like does. NARA must offer training of, on of records management Of course it management does on directly. records management. The issue for me, for the focus here was, are they, um, are they themselves offering any kind of course or module within a course that is focused on FOIA, the FOIA community learning about records management? We had conversations with the representative from the chief records officer and, and um, from Lawrence Brewer's office, and, and my understanding is that there isn't such a, uh, a module that has been developed by NARA. I myself taught lawyers for 
uh, any number of years in a uh, specific NARA records management course for lawyers, the case for agency counsel, and it was, um, I think, um, uh, a, a well-received vehicle. I understand there are changes to the general NARA program of training that have been announced, but, but nevertheless, I, we're, I'm, we're previewing here a recommendation from our committee that a more robust training for the FOIA community yeah. on records management is, uh, yeah. uh, is something that we're, uh, we would recommend. All right, and uh, this is Ryan again. Are there any other questions on the phone? Okay, lastly, uh, we wanted to provide a little, uh, uh, little preview of some of the kind of draft recommendations that we have been um, discussing, and uh, these are still being deliberated, and we welcome the full committee's input on these. Um, we'll, we'll discuss them verbally today. And Jason and I didn't discuss how we're going to divide these up. So I'll, um, I'll, we have eight separate kind of draft recommendations currently. Um, I'll grab the first one, Jason, to start. Uh, so we're, we were looking at, um, again, we're looking at records management, how it can improve administration of the FOIA. And so one area that we looked at was Section G of the FOIA, 552G, which requires agencies to make available certain information to assist requesters in filing FOIA requests, like a FOIA guide, like a guide or an instruction manual for that, um, it requires agencies post uh, list of systems and uh, information systems and that sort of thing. Um, and so, as part of our review of this, we've looked at agency websites and kind of done a non-scientific survey of, of, of some of the cabinet level and mid-size agencies and to, to get a, a sense of how agencies are complying with this element. I'll note that DOJ issued guidance, I think, at the end of 2017 on updating agency websites, which had some additional guidance here. Uh, and so it's been our view, it, some agencies do it very well. Some agencies, there's room for improvement. And so we're looking as the subcommittee at this, at this more closely. And kind of our draft recommendation right now is that agencies should publish enhanced documentation of their internal records management policies and practices as part of their part of fulfilling Section G of the FOIA. So that may include uh, providing or providing uh, access to or links to agency record schedules, so requesters can identify what records the agency maintains, records file plans, um, records management guidance given to agency staff. Um, information about agency record systems. And so, uh, for example, some agencies post lists of their Privacy Act systems of records. And um, in some instances, we couldn't find the non-Privacy Act system equivalent. What, what records and what systems do agencies keep outside of Privacy Act records, record systems? And then also information about their cap management of email um, by capstone. Um, and so this is just one area we're looking at, potentially to recommend that DOJ uh, supplement guidance uh, or potentially a legislative fix as well. Jason, you want to take two? Well, we've covered two, which is that we will, um, we're talking about a recommendation involving training, and so we'll, uh, we've covered that. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt you, this is Alina. Can we just go back to one for a second? So I just want to say, for my part, I've, I have not read 552G in a while. <laughs> so it was intriguing to hear that recommendation and, and that thought process. And I just wanted to make sure that um, everyone was aware of exactly what G said. Do you have it on your iPad by any chance? I don't have a connection. I could pull it up. Oh, no, that's okay. <laughs> I just thought maybe you had it handy. No, I don't. I just found it sort of an obscure part of FOIA that we normally don't read, but um, in terms of a legislative fix, what were you thinking about? So this is Ryan. So I, I took a look into legislative history and tried to find when this language was added. Um, I believe it was added very early on in, the, in FOIA, and I don't believe it's been updated. Um, you know, it wasn't, it, it did, the language, I don't believe, changed in the recent amendments. Um, and so I think, I think it, it, you know, I think the time would be good to look at this um, to, to, uh, to potentially add it, uh, add additional language and clarity about what expectations are for agencies. I think similarly, now that we have 
a government-wide effort, uh, the government-wide FOIA portal, um, and also the IDEA Act, which passed recently, which requires agencies to standardize their websites. Um, we have an opportunity to um, potentially make some changes in this area so that it's standard, the standard is, is set across the government uh, for what is provided to requesters to enable them to make um, requests to the government. It's the existing provision that FOIA handbooks and yeah. indexes and other yeah. uh, documentation is, is made available to the public, but um, I think that the, uh, it could be made more robust with um, right. some further best practices here. Mm -hmm. um, so. um, I, Melanie Peste, I don't, um, I don't want to get ahead, or let me just add a suggestion for, as part of your, your looking into this. Um, when we were doing research for the National FOIA portal, one of the things we found with our re research with the requester community was that the universal way that people look for information is just sort of the Google model. They just type in a topic and they don't, the, and because we all live in a war, world where that's what you do when you want to look something up, we want to be, I, I think it, it makes me think that we need to be careful mm -hmm. that the, the provision about the major information systems that you have to list in your FOIA reference guide, is how useful is it going to be? I mean, it's a requirement now and, and agencies have to have it as part of their FOIA reference guide, but I think practically the requester community doesn't necessarily want to go and look and figure out like, well, what record system and what's, what is a record system and I just yeah. want records on X. Wherever you have an agency, it's not my job to figure out what system it's in. So I would, my only suggestion um, to the subcommittee is to, to sort of factor in the user experience um, in, in terms of usability and usefulness of the information. We will. Thank you, Melanie. Sure. Uh, thanks. And, and it's, um, I think Ryan's and my thought that after a couple more iterations within our own subcommittee, we'll be able to report out these recommendations in written form for the next hearing, uh, next public meeting. Um, and then um, we should have a conversation going forward. So we're, yep. Um, yep. we're just previewing yep. it here. Yep. How many more minutes do I have, Elena? Oh, you have so many more minutes. Well, okay, You're a okay. few. All right, so I'm not going to take too long. I'm just yep. going to, as a teaser, say, here's, here are the other recommendations we are talking about. One is um, to um, have NARA and OGIS at DOJ um, issue best practice guidance on what constitutes an adequate search for FOIA purposes of email, including capstone. Uh, the fourth recommendation is NARA, OGIS, and DOJ to issue best practice guidance on compliance with record keeping and access requirements for records in the form of electronic messaging on commercial networks within the meaning of 44 U.S.C. 2911. Uh, these are both traditional email services on commercial networks like Gmail, but also a range of more ephemeral messaging apps uh, with uh, some of them with built-in capability of self-destruction. Um, the next recommendation is for um, tighter integration of uh, FOIA access issues into various records management initiatives. Um, at NARA and otherwise. Um, we could see expanding uh, the annual agency self-certification survey to include additional questions to agencies about electronic record repositories. And I won't beat the drum about Capstone, but we have a bunch of subparts on that. Um, we want to have a continuing conversation uh, with NARA about FERMI, the Federal Electronic Records Modernization Initiative, and its universal requirements and building in access um, requirements. Uh, into that model that's, um, that NARA is uh, going forth with. Um, we want to uh, possibly talk about A130 and incorporating FOIA access in, in some further way um, to what OMB has done. The next recommendation uh, comes from a uh, conversation and uh, our, our um, invites to the Inspector General community that uh, we had earlier as part of this round in this committee. Um, and that um, uh, we are discussing whether the archivist should make some kind of request to SIGI, the um, uh, Council of Inspector Generals on Government Integrity and Efficiency, to uh, consider prioritizing or making the examination of access to federal records it, um, a cross-cutting project um, or priority area for agency inspectors general. And there was a lot of conversation at that prior meeting about uh, what um, whether in individual IG offices there could be 
some point of contact established for FOIA and for records management, and so we want to develop uh, our thinking on that. Uh, two more to go, and these two um, I wish to um, expressly uh, say that, uh, that we want to work uh, with the vision subcommittee on um, and so that we're dovetailing and not um, overlapping and, any, and, and being redundant. Um, one is um, uh, a, uh, a recommendation that goes to the newly uh, enacted um, Foundations of Evidence-Based Policy Making Act, um, which incorporates the Open Government Data Act, creating CDO or Chief Data Officer positions at each agency. Uh, increasingly in the future, we're in a CDO, open government data, gover open government data world, but um, I think we would like to have a conversation about um, marrying up FOIA and uh, open data in a way that would be useful and to make sure that CDOs throughout the government um, are aware of their of existing laws and regulations on FOIA and records management. That's something that I think we want to talk about with the Vision Committee. And second and last uh, in our recommendations, uh, sort of a joint thing to talk about further, is that um, we're talking about whether the archivist should take the lead or uh, that there be a government initiative in promoting research into using artificial intelligence technology to improve the ability to search through government electronic record repositories and to segregate sensitive material in government records including but not limited to material otherwise within the scope of the nine FOIA exemptions. I, I must say that this is a, my own particular soapbox that I believe that we are entering a world of dark digital data, that government records that are not accessible because of PII and other sensitivities. And so I think um, it is within the mandate of this committee to, uh, to think about how to improve both records management and FOIA by using AI technology. And this initiative could include using research components of NARA, of GSA, of NIDR-D, which is the Networking and Information Technology Research and Development Program, um, with coordination with OMB, with uh, CDO councils, with OSTP, with NIST, uh, with chief privacy officers, with DOJ, with any um, interested components of government who want to be um, sort of at sort of uh, thinking about state-of-the-art initiatives on AI. I know there's executive order and there's lots of interest in AI. Uh, why not have an intersection here with this committee and, and have a recommendation about AI and FOIA? So uh, with that, those are what we're thinking about. And um, I will commit, uh, we'll, we'll put these down in writing and, and uh, send them around. And if there's time in some other, either on September 6th or at some future time to have a the full conversation with all committee members in advance uh, um, of actually drafting a subcommittee report, we'd be happy to have that dialogue. Great. Chris, did you want to? This is, this is Chris Knox. Um, uh, you mentioned coordinating with the Vision Subcommittee for... You mentioned coordinating with the Vision Subcommittee for the final two. Uh, I think that's probably best under our priority and, and transparency sub sub section <laughs> and that's led by Joan so it might make sense for a member of your subcommittee to join that that group to coordinate I'm sure we can find someone yes. this is Joan Kaminer um, I will invite you to our next meeting uh, thank you for that Joan can you repeat that please oh sorry can you hear me now we can yes. so I will be sure you include um, Call. Whoever that's going to be from the records management subcommittee. Okay. Yeah, you guys. Can, I'll, I'll make sure you have the information and you can decide who should participate. Okay. Uh, any of the other members of the records management subcommittee want to comment or say anything more than what has already been said? Looking over here yeah. to this distinguished corner, mm -hmm. Bradley. Okay. Uh, all right, uh, so let's move on to time volume. Last but not least, I know Emily's not here today, so I guess, Bradley, it falls on your shoulders to it does. brief us. Uh, Bradley White, DHS. I want to apologize in advance if my voice is anything funny. <clears throat> I'm fighting allergies and I'm losing. Uh, so with that said, I'm going to ask uh, 
some of my, I'll call them action teams instead of sub subcommittees, uh, some of the action team leaders to step in. Uh, we originally started off with seven action items. And after a discussion, we wound up combining the last four, which related to um, identifying uh, people in the requester community and in the government community that we would survey, um, which is what Kevin's going to talk about later. Our first action item related to uh, tracking progress of past recommendations, uh, which we had a really good presentation, I believe, at our last committee meeting about that. Um, and we will again today. Exactly. So I'm going to move on. <laughs> the second action item regarded, uh, sorry, related to analyzing complex requests. And we were really happy to receive help from uh, Carrie Talashay Smith, right, um, with OGIS uh, to help on that. And we received her information a while ago. And I have to say, I was actually surprised with the data. And I think that comes from just being stuck within my DHS bubble, where we've seen our complex requests uh, increase steadily over time. So I thought that that was something that would go on. Excuse me that would go across the government, but it actually looks like less than half of federal agencies have seen an increase in complex requests. <clears throat> but what really interested me is the request, so a number of agencies have seen their complex requests go down by about 56%. But the ones that have seen their complex requests go up, and DHS is definitely in that number, that increase has gone up by 251%. I don't know if there's anything we can kind of extrapolate out to the greater government from that yet. We haven't really gone into all that data. But um, I found that really, really interesting. Did you want to? No. Okay. Uh, and then our third group was on international research, uh, looking at international models related to the management of high volume time crunches with FOIA. Uh, happy to welcome James Stocker to that group. So thank you for joining us. Uh, we appreciate that, uh, your expertise. And uh, after that, I'm going to turn over to Kevin to talk about our survey stuff. Yep. Well, the good news is I've basically given you that report. <laughs> we, have, we have now narrowed down our questions for the uh, time volume portion that, that, that are going to be sent to requesters and agency officers with an eye toward, again, um, at least with the agency side, officer side, trying to pin down as many responses as possible during the ASAP, the ASAP conference in um, July. Kevin, this is Alina. I don't want to put you on the spot, but would you be able to preview any of the questions? Um, if you'd let me boot up my computer, I could. No, you know, um, well, Sarah wrote a lot of the requesters. So you're putting two people on the spot. So, this is Sarah Kotler. Um, to be fair, we've gone through many iterations of these yeah, surveys. Yeah, it's hard to remember what's left. We've cut a lot of questions out <laughs> yeah. um, because of the way we've used it. But I primarily, being on the FOIA officer side, I primarily design the questions with input, of course, that would be asked of requesters because I always want to know what are these requesters thinking. Right. Um, whereas Kevin, who comes from the other side, took the lead on drafting the questions for the agencies because he's probably thinking well, what in the world are these agencies thinking. And so I really just started with what I generally want to know. And I know some of the questions are definitely geared to sort of what level of research does a requester do before he or she makes a FOIA request? Um, again, there was probably broken down into a variety of questions originally, but we tried to make it fewer questions and more open. So it might say something along the lines now of, what, if any, research might you do before you make a FOIA request? That things that might come to mind are, I check the agency's website. You know, I see if the logs are posted and what other requests on this subject um, have been handle before because if I were making a FOIA request, that's what I would do. Um, but I also have a lot of inside knowledge that many FOIA requesters don't have. So it was sort of what are you, for me, when I design the questions is what are you doing before you make a FOIA request? Mm -hmm. yeah. What kinds of things do you do when you have a pending FOIA request? Um, do you call and check on status? Um, do you uh, appeal if you don't get an answer? Do you have a constructive denial? And then certainly what, what would drive you to uh, bring a lawsuit? Um, involving your FOIA request. So for me, it sort of went those through those, the questions go through the stages of before, during, and potentially after what you would do. Yeah, and I was able to pull up some of the agency survey questions. I won't go through them all one by one, but I would say that, that they kind of deal with pressure points or frustration points. It, it, it may be a little venting opportunity for some people here, but you know, what is an impediment to your agency's control to processing FOIA requests? Then we have 
what are common areas of confusions among requesters in that sort of couple things in that vein. A couple things regarding the tracking software, whether people think the tracking and you know, review software works. Um, one about interaction with OGIS and how it's working for them. Uh, and of course, some of these, this brings up the idea of will they be blind answers, right? Well, I think we're going to leave it up to people. I think we want to gain as much information from the responder uh, the respondent as possible, you know, at least with regard to the size of the agency and the volume of requests. We don't want, you know, we, we certainly have learned, if, if I've learned one thing, obviously, and we, we already knew it anyway through the last nine months of this, it's not every agency is the same, right? Um, you know, what, what, so it's kind of like, how's your tracking software working? How are your interactions with uh, requesters working? What kind of um, guidance, do you feel you're getting enough guidance from other areas of government and internally? And then my final, the final question which we had written up and I cannot help but ask it is, if you had a magic wand to fix FOIA, what would you do with it? <laughs> yeah. I can't wait to see some of those. Great, thank you. Yes, sure. This is James Stoker. I just wanted to ask, by blind, do you mean uh, are you giving the option to the uh, to whether or not to identify themselves? Yeah, I, by name. I mean, I think there could be different levels of that, and and I understand it's not scientific to do this, but I do think you know there will be there there is a need for people to not identify themselves, maybe not identify their agency, but we really would love for people to give us as much information as possible. At a minimum, I think we do need to be able to know, obviously, and we probably will because they'll be wearing name tags, I assume, but we do need to know or be able to identify in conjunction with the responses, especially for purpose of reporting back here and maybe including in the full report when we quote people, mm -hmm. um, if we want to do that directly, you know, it's a high volume agency. It's a, it's a intelligence agency. It's something along those lines is going to be necessary. But we're trying to offer flexibility. As a follow-up question, uh, will you, I, I don't know if you need to ask them to sign some sort of release or anything like that. I know we may be getting a little bit formal here, but coming from uh, academia, whenever Kirsten, we do any you, sort of questionnaire, we usually have to run it by kind of an ethics committee. And I, I don't mean to kind of you know lay impediments in the way, but just. Well, it's good that we get them out of the way now. Right. <laughs> I, no, I think that's an excellent question. This is Kirsten and um, Claire Shanley, who's the executive director of ASAP, is um, I'm sure already on it, but if she's not, I will yeah. ask her to Thank be you. on it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I th this is Melanie. I think to sort of just piggyback on that, I think it will be important for people to understand that it's a voluntary thing. Sure. Yeah. As yeah. obvious, and and the the purpose for which the questions are being asked. Yeah, that that's good to know. I mean, maybe I don't know if we want to go a full actual waiver release that they'll sign, but cer certainly. The voluntary nature is, of course, we will be sitting, I, I assume, kind of in vendor row, right, you know, at the, yeah. <laughs> at the con conference, and they'll know, they can stop, nobody's forcing them to sit down with us. We're going to be asking, we'll probably be like those folks on the street asking for money for charities, you know. Yeah. Should you spend some time on FOIA? We'd really love your help. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that's a good point. Somebody, Lizette just said, maybe we need to bribe people, give candy out or something candy. like that. Yeah, that's wrong. I can't believe I just used the word bribe in a federal government office, but so it's not a bribe. We will, we will entice them to come sit down with us. Hi, this is Abby Mosheim, and I just wanted to report a little more on what International Models has been doing. So we welcome James to our group, and Ginger came back, and um, since our last meeting, um, Patricia and I met with, or over the phone anyway, with our very own Tom Sisman. And we also met with Toby Mendel of the Center for Law and Democracy uh, to try to focus on uh, some countries to do research on to compare our law with and what we could learn from those countries. And we've come up with a list. I'm not sure that we've settled on this list, but this is what we have so far. Mexico, Canada, India, Chile, Argentina, Afghanistan, and Sri Lanka. Um, and then we had a sub-subcommittee call, I think that was last week, um, looking at how to approach uh, researching the laws. And James came up with a great idea of first coming up with a list of questions that we would have in mind while going through the laws. And so he is working on that excellent list right now. Um, and then we'll meet again to divvy up the work and dig in and get started.
This is James Stoker. I just wanted to ask if there are any questions that other subcommittees or other sub-subcommittees are looking at that might benefit from an international perspective. Um, you could reach out to me and, and, and let me know what kind of information you're interested in, and then maybe in our process of doing research, uh, we can uh, try to address that question as well. Now, uh, the list could get really big, and, and we have a lot of cases in mind, at least at the moment, so uh, we may be a little bit limited in how much we can, we can do, but uh, we'd certainly love to know if if uh, anyone's work could benefit from that. So thanks. Great. Thanks for that offer. That's great. Any other questions for time and volume subcommittee? Anyone on the phone? Um, oh, Lizette. Alina. Yes. I'll speak a little bit about what we're doing on the complex. Can you speak a little more? Than sure. This is Lizette. And I will talk a little bit about um, the action committee on the time and volume subcommittee that's looking at the complex requests that um, Brad spoke of or mentioned earlier. So um, I am working with Patricia Weth on this and the, the goal here is to see if we can come up with recommendations based on what we've seen with agencies that have a high volume of complex requests. So um, <clears throat> our roadmap for that has been to collect <clears throat> excuse me a lot of data thanks to research fe fellows at um, the presidential library um, that Alina and Kirsten uh, recommended to us who gave us um, basically a survey or canvassed all the annual reports and looked at the numbers um, over a five-year period that's a lot of data. Um, and so what we decided to do is cross-reference that with the summary of chief boy officer reports. We like the greens and the reds. It helps to kind of focus where, you know, where success stories are and where there's room for improvement. Um, and so doing that will help us, we were thinking, identify, um, we don't want to get too, too in the weeds with um, the number of agencies we're looking at since we are you know, a year away from when we need to produce um, our product. But maybe a top three or top five of success stories, both you know, um, in managing their complex requests and maybe where, where there was uh, room for improvement. Um, and, and with that, um, trying to talk to these agencies, whether we use the questions that um, the others have developed, um, maybe we use ASAP as a vehicle or in some other format um, to speak with the agencies to see if we can derive some best practices or, or lessons learned, um, and then taking what we learned from that discussion and formulating some kind of recommendations um, for, the, for this group, obviously, but also for other agencies to use as they, as they can. Okay, great, thank you. Um, any other sub subcommittees of the time volume subcommittee <laughs> want to report out? <laughs> no, this is actually very helpful. This is, how, this is how work gets done. Tom. Oh, I thought you were raising your hand. Okay. All right, well, I want to keep on schedule. Um, so uh, we're two minutes out, actually, from being off schedule. Are you proud of me, Kirsten? Uh, so I want to invite Martha Murphy up. Is Martha still here? Yay. Right there, yes. thought she ran away. I saw her going up the stairs. Uh, Martha's going to uh, give us a report slash update on the committee recommendations from past FOIA advisory committees and um, take any questions. Ahead. There we go. There we go. Um, I'll try to be quick. Um, as you know, the first recommendation uh, we're calling complete the, T the CFO Technology Subcommittee has been established. Um, and they're using the Chief FOIA Officer reports um, to assess the IT landscape, identify best practices, and then they're going to make recommendations for agencies based on their, AT, uh, their IT capabilities. They recognize that some agencies 
are bigger, have bigger systems, some are smaller, so they're going to try to cater their recommendations to um, different types of agencies. And we are currently helping to arrange for the subcommittee to present before the CIO Council in July. Uh, Martha, I also just want to add, I've invited them to come and brief our, our committee here um, a little bit later this year. They said they're not quite ready yet, mm -hmm. but um, I think it would be really important to cross-pollinate, hear what they're doing, because they've they have a very active um, member base, and the two sub the two subcommittee chairs are very active. So I think they have a lot of information they can share. Absolutely. Um, with the second recommendation, um, Jason, I see you did some work um, going through, but we had our student actually look at all of the um, reports and compile information. We just need to go through and sort of clean it up a little bit, and then we'll be forwarding it on. So it'll be a little more comprehensive. Um, we are on schedule. We should be getting for this is the uh, recommendation that um, NARA's FAR Council representative, we're going to send a business case on to the FAR Council. And um, I just spoke to her the, earlier this week. We're hoping to get our business case to the Council, OMB and GSA, within the next couple weeks. So we're still on schedule for this one. And I'm sorry, I am kind of flying through. So if anybody has any questions, just stop me. Um, there's been no real change to recommendation number four or five. <laughs> We're just still hoping to get to that in the fourth quarter of 2020. <laughs> uh, recommendation <laughs> number six. This is complete again. And number seven as well. Nothing's changed with this one. Um, finally, the last recommendation from the 2014 to 2016 term, OGIS has now forwarded a proposed red line version um, of the change to the regs, and we are currently awaiting reply or action. So we added a little image there, maybe to help understand where we are. <laughs> We're leading that horse to water. <laughs> where we are. That's all I got. Anyone have any questions? You really flew through that, Martha. I just, <laughs> um, I just want to make a comment. This is Alina, a comment about recommendation number six. Uh, we did actually include it in our annual report that we sent up to Congress uh, and to the President. And uh, we s made several suggestions of ways to start approaching this issue. But I think, as many of the subcommittee and committee members know, this is a very um, thorny issue that has a lot of uh, aspects to it that I think are quite difficult. Which issue? This is discuss? Section 508 compliance and how it intersects with proactive disclosure responsibilities under FOIA. And uh, you know, we've had the first advisory committee looked at this issue, the second advisory committee looked at this issue. I, I don't think any one of the subcommittees is looking at it right now, um, which is fine, but I think it really needs some more careful study. Um, and a really good understanding of what's actually going on at the agency level that I don't think we necessarily have. Um, what the second advisory committee gathered was some anecdotal um, evidence that they were able to incorporate in, in bringing this recommendation about. But we certainly advanced it in our report, uh, and we've talked it up to folks on the Hill, but I think it's, there's a long way to go. We need help. Thank you. Okay. Um, if there are no other questions from the committee, I know Melanie wanted to just briefly update us on what's going on at OIB. Yeah. I, um, uh, Melanie Pastey, I have a, uh, a fun update. We have just published literally this morning our summary of the annual FOIA reports for fiscal year 18. So all the data, all the agency annual FOIA reports are in, cleared, and the data uploaded onto FOIA.gov. Um, so that was a big, uh, obviously a bigger challenge this year with the shutdown than prior years. I want to just give you what all of us expected. The number of incoming requests went up yet again. It's like people cannot get enough of FOIA. Number? We are up to 863,000 requests, um, which, and actually, and well, and I'll just tell you, Compare, but we also, agencies also overall increase their processing of requests. So once again, agencies keep upping their game and doing better each year. 
agencies overall processed 830,000 requests. And when you look at how many requests were received last fiscal year, it was 818. So if the incoming had stayed the same, the processing of 18 would have surpassed the incoming and we would have seen backlog reduction. But we just, no matter how much the agencies process more, each year we seem to be in a cycle where the incoming yet again trumps the processing. So it, it's, it's, it's a really you know, interesting trend that just keeps continuing. The exemptions that were most commonly used remain the same as they always have been. The, over 50% of the exemptions used are 6 and 7C for personal privacy. 7E is the third most used exemption. Um, we also talked a little bit um, uh, during the course of this discussion today about the difference in uh, the difference in agency size and how the proportionality uh, of who gets the most requests so once again we had five agencies that got 70 percent of all FOIA requests uh, DHS with almost 400,000 requests last year they were 395 so it's just staggering uh, DOJ was next we were 96,000 so we're heading to the hundred thousand the six digit uh, DOD was after was afterward with the next one with 57,000 NARA with 52,000 uh, and then USDA was our fifth largest agency this year which is that way they are a new entrant into the top five <laughs> in whether that's a good thing or a bad thing um, and then um, the one thing um, that was also a, a nice highlight was that agencies were able to reduce the amount of time to process, that they took to process simple track requests. So that helped show that our focus on that, uh, our, our, our attention, our, our negotiating with requesters to, to get simple track requests is reaping rewards. Agencies are able to process those in a faster amount of time. So that was a really nice statistic. So um, the data is um, all available, as I said, on FOIA.gov. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Any questions for Melanie? Anyone on the phone? Okay, so we're right on schedule. We are now at the point where we're happy to take any public comments. Um, I would like to um, ask Sheila if there's anything on live stream that needs to be reported. She's shaking her head no. Everyone is just glued to their computer screens and just can't think of anything to say. Um, do we have anyone from the audience here that would like to come up and uh, offer any comments to the committee? No? Okay. Well, that was easy. Um, so uh, I think we're all very excited about all the work that's going on, and I think it was great to hear from each other about what is going on. Uh, our next meeting is Thursday, September 5th uh, at 10 a.m. right here in McGowan Theater. Um, I want to invite everyone to visit the OGIS website um, and social media. We're going to post all this information up there from today's meeting. And uh, I'm just going to ask anyone on the committee if there are any other questions before we adjourn. Otherwise, we'll stand adjourned. Any, any? Oh, I'm um, sorry. Kirsten is asking me to remind everyone to return their NARA folders as they are, they've become quite a scarce resource and they're fairly expensive to reproduce, we as we have learned. Them. So we are <coughs> reusing them. Um, if there are no other questions or concerns, oh, Jason has a question or a concern. Uh just a question. Uh, Alina, do you have, or Kirsten, do you have um, any uh, ideas for speakers or for people who are going to be invited to give presentations to us uh, through the remaining time that we're together? Um, so I did mention that I thought the technology subcommittee co-chairs, I'm putting them on the spot, but I would like for them to come and brief us. Um, but I think otherwise we have a pretty open slate. We do certainly need to leave room for lots of work time at the last two meetings. Mm -hmm. So, but if you have any suggestions, it sounds like maybe you do. Um, uh, perhaps well, you could let us know. I, I would, uh, yeah, I do think that we do need to leave work time. And so if this is precluded by it, then so be it. But I, I would be interested in hearing uh, from some lawyer advocates from the public interest community of what they find as challenges uh, in filing lawsuits against the government. And Please. we can talk <laughs> offline about some of our favorite people who are out there who are experts at this, and uh, I'd like to invite them to, uh, 
to come. I'm not going to put Lee on the spot, but we have Lee on the on the committee. He can more than happy to uh, <laughs> to, to, to gather well, a little we panel. Other people, obviously, yeah, sure. we can gather I, a panel. I'd be more than happy to participate. Okay. Uh, anyone else? All right, everyone, we stand adjourned. Thank you again for your time. I'm giving you back about 10 minutes. All right, great. Thanks. <laughs>